Uh, kia ora tato, no mai hare mai. Welcome to our council meeting of uh, 30th of November 2022. Uh, warm welcome to people online and those in the gallery. Lovely to see a bit of colour in the gallery. Uh, Councillors and public uh, and, uh, and staff here, we, the meeting has been recorded, it's been live streamed um, on the council's YouTube channel. Uh, in terms of health and safety, I'll just get that up on the screen. Most people are well versed in this, um, in terms of uh, the unlikely event of an emergency. Uh, if you do hear the alarm, we exit uh, via the green signs, the nearest fire exit. We evacuate to the assembly area at the clock tower uh, down on the square to Marae uh, no, This is a non-smoking facility. Uh, again, unlike the event of a defibrillator, that is located in the front of house on the ground floor. Um, toilets are in the link span as you came in. Uh, any incidences, please report them to the community administrator. Uh, to staff uh, here, please, if you could, um, when answering, um, when you're answering any questions or um, presenting anything, if you could please just give your name in the first instance. Uh, we have a number of people online today, uh, and. Councillors uh, Bowen, Dennison, Hancock and Wood are all on line. We are going to adjourn um, for a break, obviously, and that's fairly fluid at uh, 10, 10.30, depending on submissions. Uh, we will then adjourn the meeting at 12pm and resume for, a, resume for a councillor briefing here, in here at 1pm, um, and then we will go back into council if it is still going. I'm sure it will be. Okay, we move through to our order of business for the day, um, and apologies, um, I just have one for early departure from Councillor Bowen, um, that uh, that be received, I'm happy to um, um, move that, uh, is that seconded, thank you, and Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks Mr Mayor, I'll just put in a... Um Preemptive strike apologies for early departure, just in case we're still going at three o'clock. Thank you. Three o'clock, sure. I, I I hope we're not, but we may be. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Thank you. It's happy to accept all that. Uh, there any other? And it's seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Okay, we will vote, please. And that has passed 16 votes for, none against. Thank you. Right, moving through to number two, notification of additional items. Uh, I have received none, and I don't think there's anything off the floor. Uh, we will move through to declarations of interest, and I have received one. Um, thank you, Councillor Johnson. That's, I think, for item 12? Uh, yeah, item 12, because my husband is a coach at the Archery Club. Right, thank you. Um, Councillor Harpeter. Um, for item number seven, please. Thank you. Okay, so Councillor Johnson, item 12, um, Councillor Harper to item 7. Thank you. I'm happy to move those. We'll get that up on screen in a moment. We don't need to move them. Okay, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. We don't need to worry about that. That's fine. Thank you, as long as it's documented. Um, right, moving through to confirmation of the minutes of our uh, meeting of the 16th of November uh, 2022, part 1 public, also part 2 confidential, will be confirmed as a true and correct record. I'm going to take them both together unless um, councillors not wish that to happen. Um, I'm happy to move those. Seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Any matters arising? There being none, we will vote. That has passed 16 votes for uh, none against. Right, we will now move into our hearing of submissions uh, around uh, 
at a, at a stone reserve. Um, and councillors, um, we have a number today. Uh, and I'll go to Green Corridors Group first, if I can. Oh, OK, sorry, before we do that, sorry, I've jumped the gun. My apologies. We will resolve that we hear the submissions from presenters. Uh, that we resolve that Council hear submissions from presenters who indicate they wish to be heard in support of their submission, that Council note the procedure for hearing of submissions as, as described in the procedure sheet. I'm happy to move that, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Uh, any questions, comments to that? There being none, we will vote. It has passed 16 votes for, thank you. Now, we'll go back to green, sky, green corridors. My apologies. Thank you. Uh, who have we got here? Rosemary? Susan? And? Anthony. Anthony. Welcome. Um, you're well versed with, um, now just press the buttons for your... Um, uh, your microphones, you've got 10 minutes, um, and that includes questions from my colleagues. The floor is yours. Thank you for affording us the opportunity to speak to our submission regarding the proposed revoking of the reserve status for part of Addiston Reserve. The undersigned members of Green Corridors are strongly opposed to any precedent that might be set by rezoning reserve land that is currently used by the community and has great potential for further upgrading. With housing sections getting smaller, we feel more land should be set aside for recreation, for the health and well-being of the community, not less. We are particularly concerned at the proposed subdivision for houses on the 1.4 hectare farmland north of the main Addiston Reserve, as currently water from the flatland drains down the slopes onto and across the walking track in the reserve and results in slips along the full length of this area. These slips are active, as council knows, because they have to clear some of it off the walking track, and our narrow two to three metre buffer of plants above the slope is inadequate to so hold the soil. The proposed stormwater mitigation to deal with extra water resulting from impermeable footprints of houses and roading on this farmland will not prevent aggravation of this problem, and the integrity of the native trees and plants already growing in the reserve will be compromised. Sue Lemoyne spends many hours working in the reserve and will now discuss the reserve in more detail. Good morning, everybody. Addistone Gully is a thriving, regenerating gully. It is important. It is one of the best examples of a regenerating gully nahiri in the area, containing many species of native trees, plants, and a good level of bird life, and its waters, which are in the form of small streams, swamps, and pond, flow ultimately to our awa, the Manawatu. Retention of the 1.4 hectares of reserved land, along with the already proposed reserved portion of land above the gully, would afford the opportunity to plant buffer zones of up to 20 metres wide with, long, with lower si sized forest edge plants between the edges of the gully and the proposed development. These planted buffer zones would help retain the edges of the gully, which is prone to slipping by slowing water runoff into the gully and once mature, the roots of the plants will help stabilise the soil. This slide here shows um, the impact of water on the gully. This is a slip that occurred in around about April or May, end of, beginning of May this year. You can see it's about two and a half metres in height and it actually extends further off to the left. And you can see a drainage pipe that comes down and you can see the sedimentation that has occurred at the bottom. And on the right, you can see a historical slip. The slip occurred approximately there. The slips cause damage to the vegetation. They effectively kill off plants and trees. They expose the soil, which is then carried by the water runoff into the waterways. Keeping the land as a reserve and Planting out the buffer zones with these lower-sized forest edge plants will also help the 
protect the gully from close neighbours who may find the emerging canopy trees in the gully, such as Totara, Matai, Hino, blocking their views or taking light. If this becomes the case, then the trees are at risk of being pruned, poisoned or ring-barked, or as in the case last year of a close neighbour on Pacific Drive end of Adderstone, simply felled. The buffer zones would also provide the added benefit of increasing native plant cover, bringing in more native birds and improving the biodiversity of the area. We also ask that a buffer zone is allowed for the 0.33 hectares portion of reserved land on Pacific Drive as the side of the gully faces all the same issues. Not only retaining the land is important for protecting the gully, retaining the land for recreational purposes is in the best interests of the current and future residents of Akautri Summerhill area. In the proposed Akautri structure plan, very little flat usable land has been set aside for recreation, and as this 2.4 hectares of land is already designated as a reserve, it should remain so. The road, the road shared, the sh oh, sorry. The opportunities to develop it over the years to come are exciting. It has the potential to provide a safe, off-road, shared path linking Pacific Drive, Johnston Drive and Akautri. The shared path can be used not only by active commuters, but recreationally by people with mobility issues, families with small children and scooters who are unable to access the gully trails. Um, that is a picture of our a slide of our idea of where a pathway could run. The area will provide sufficient space for dog walkers, for children to have enough space to kick a ball or throw a frisbee. There can be seating and grouping of trees that could provide shade and a playground that is not adjacent to a road. Opportunities for kids to safely ride their bikes and allow them to roam freely and have fun without fear of cars. The PNCC's 2131 strategic Direction Eco City goals state that the PNCC wishes to increase the health and the amenity of our, our environment, to work with iwi and community groups to re establish bush and increase native tree canopies, to see an increase in bird numbers, to reduce carbon emissions, and to have active communities and promote active transport, and that it plans and cares about the future. We ask that these goals and this vision should be applied to the decision making on the future of this piece of land and that the conclusion should be to retain it to meet the needs of the environment and the current and future residents of Akautari and Palmerston North. Thank you. Thank you, um, Susan. Right, comments or questions, sorry. Um, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, I just wanted to see if you could tell us how long um, Green Corridors has been planting into the gully there, you know, how many years um, sort of work and effort we're talking about. I think we started in about 2005. So some of the trees are, are um, pretty old now. And um, we started doing working bees in there uh, four to five years ago, uh, which has meant that the health of the plants has increased hugely. Okay, and then in terms of the slips, is that a recent phenomenon, or have there been slips occurring all the time that you've been working in there? Um, uh, as you see in that slide there, you can see the historical slip on the right. Um, I don't know when that occurred. There is a large slip that fell into the pond um, probably about two years ago, and the small slips are just happening all the time, just small slips. This is a larger slip, and it shows what's capable of happening there. Okay, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, with those small slips, you, your, your, your thinking is it's, it's coming from the, the seepage of water from above? Yes, it is. Um, this one is the result of it of the water going across the track, but on the other side, which is the slope immediately below that 1.4 hectare, um, there are large slips which we have tried to control, but we can't. We just don't have enough land to plant. Right. Councillor Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for speaking to your submission. 
The setback that you're asking for, remind me the, the dimension of that. I'm sorry? The, the setback that you're indicating you would support, mm. how, how wide was that? Well, I'm suggesting 20 metres would be a good amount of land to at least get a, a good cover of plants on. Mm. And can I ask how you came to arrive at 20 as opposed to some other number? At the moment, it's only about two to three at the very most, yeah. um, and that's totally inadequate. Um, in fact, I was walking along the grassland a while ago, and I put my foot into a hidden crack, mm. and that was a good five to six meters from the edge of a current slip. Um, so it's progressing into that farmland by quite a lot. And if we could retain some of the moisture coming off there, with the plants, that would help enormously. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, you're, you're, just further to Councillor Barrett's question, you're, you're, you want to go further and actually ask that that, um, uh, that planting, that riparian planting, goes further back into the into the actual um, paddock or, or park. Yes. yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Appreciate you coming in. Thank you for the work that uh, your organisation does as well. Right, um, we'll now go to Gillian Claridge. Is Gillian Claridge here? Thank you. This is submission number 35, councillors. Welcome, Gillian. Oh. Thank you very much for the opportunity to um, hear my, uh, our case. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of my husband, Jolyn, as, as well. Um, first of all, um, the whole area, um, as we've just heard, uh, was currently designated as green space to be preserved for future generations. Once it's developed, it can never be returned to green space. So this is an important decision and council needs to be able to justify the decision to us, the ratepayers, with very clear and convincing arguments. Um, and we'd like to um, ask some questions about this. Palmerston North needs more housing, but for whom? Um, we understand that the greatest housing need is for social housing and perhaps for first time buyers. But will these people benefit from this particular development? We'd like to know who is going to build the proposed housing. One presumes developers, possibly the same developers responsible for the existing housing in the area. The existing housing is high spec, and undoubtedly the proposed housing will be required to be the same to fit in with the neighborhood the developer will naturally wish to make the maximum profit from the exercise. So the proposed housing is very unlikely to be affordable for the average first time buyer, um, particularly given the recent height in interest, hike in um, interest rates. As ratepayers, we'd like to know if the land would be sold to a developer, if so, for how much, and how the money gained would be used by council would it be put into a general pot or would it be actually allocated for infrastructure for this area? Um, is the council planning to upgrade the infrastructure to cope not only with a new development, but with the existing housing in the area? The last time I spoke here, I was accompanied by my 18 month old supporter. Um, we both had an interest in the extension of the pathway from the north of Johnston Drive down to Pacific Drive. Um, he was 18 months old then, he's now three, and we still do not have a pathway. So you can understand that we're wondering whether the infrastructure is going to be able to keep up with any new development in this area. Um, the traffic and therefore greenhouse gas emissions will only increase with additional housing. 
This could be alleviated somewhat with better public transport, but there is no sign of planning for that. Um, as we've heard, uh, there's a probability the building will exacerbate runoff and increase the frequency of slips. Given the above, we don't see very much advantage in using a beautiful natural area to build houses that will be too expensive for people who really need them. Thank you for listening. Should I turn this off now? No, keep it, <laughs> keep, keep, keep it on in, in case we have some... Some questions. I'll, I'll start. And look, thank you, Gillian, for your um, submission and actually um, in past submissions as well. Um, you made a comment about, um, and you know, look, all your comments are very valid, but you made a comment about public transport and no planning being in place for that. Mm -hmm. you, you are aware that the regional co council, that there are our colleagues that run public transport, um, have a whole new um, public transport uh, bus plan for the city. Well, that's fantastic. Um, and is that going to be more uh, frequent buses? Yes, yes, and it does go up to Pacific Drive and in the newer area of the cafe. <coughs> that's good to know. It would be nice to see a bus timetable because, uh, quite honestly, having been at IPU for years, um, yes. I know that the students have had tremendous trouble getting into town <coughs> or out of town. And as a pensioner, I sort of thought, be nice to use the bus, um, but you can get into town at nine o'clock and then you're stuck there until two because there isn't one that comes back. Yeah. So uh, it would be marvellous if there was um, a better service. I'm right. glad to hear that. Thank you. Uh, there are no other questions of my colleagues, so again, thank you for your submission and that will be um, noted in, in our deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, our next uh, submitter is James Gordon. James, welcome. Uh, submission number 36, councillors, and on page 69 of your papers. James, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr Mayor and councillors. It's great to see um, so many faces of the people that I voted for recently, so around the table, so thank you. Um, my submission is against any development of the uh, 2.4 hectares up at the um, at a stone reserve. Um, just a bit, bit of uh, background. Our families had a lot to do with some of the community developments. Um, Perrin Park and Urban Eels, where we've seen community-led um, development of those sites and council has very, very generously and passionately contributed to those and other parks and reserves around the city such as um, the one at the northern end of town, Tremaine Ave, um, and, and now they're well used places and their destinations so thank you for that. So um, another thing I'm involved with is, um, is trapping in the reserves at the back of my place, there's a reserve there and I share some trapping responsibilities with another woman Anne and we've seen some um, really good inroads there. And as a result, you know, I spend a lot of time in those reserves and the gullies are great. They provide excellent um, opportunities for people for exercise and walking dogs and all those sorts of things. But I've noticed that there's, there's some things that they don't provide. And one of, the, one of the things is they're not really a destination in themselves. You don't see people sitting and enjoying the space very often. And also, um, they're not necessarily perceived as safe and secure by all of our people in the community. You know, being a, being a guy in amongst the trees, um, you know, you, you hear people come along the path and now... I'll stay quiet and still because I know that for especially women, they're very uncomfortable obviously with, a, with an older guy doing whatever he's doing in, in the scrub and you can hear them move forward through the area very quickly and guys will challenge you in there. And so it's, it's not really perceived as safe all the time. And, um, and another part of that is, um, and I forgot what I was going to say, where I was going with that, but I'd like to say that the reserve, open reserve land um, provides a different sort of space. It's open, 
and um, and it's a it's a big sky environment, and you don't really get much of that in Palmy, where you've got the the full views of the ranges both ways. It's an amazing place, and you can see right out to the west past the city, and it gives a real sense of space about where you are in the Manawatu. I was lucky that I was walking up there when we had that big full moon recently a few months back. And it was amazing, just the light and the whole atmosphere, and it's a real sense of place. And also, um, with regards to it being safe, the, it, it's open and you can see who's there, and there's people walking dogs a lot, and a lot of walkers, and, and it gives you opportunities there to actually stop and talk to people, where you don't find that on the walkway system, it's a hello and they've gone, but up there, people walking their dogs and playing and just being, and there's, there's more community involvement, and it gives us a, you know, that sense of community is important, and that's one of the places that that happens. Um, and, and also with regards to it being just a paddock at the moment, that's okay, because Perrin Park used to be a bit of a paddock too, and it was used, but there was ideas put forward by, um, by council, and there's a basketball hoop there, and there's an awesome playground there, and, and now it's used by all ages. You know, you go past there and you see teenagers there, and my teenage kids, they meet other kids there, you know? And you, you, you don't want them to be meeting in the reserve what are they up to, teenagers, but in a park, it's something different, they've got a reason to be there. And, and with regards to the reserve land, I'm sorry, but putting it into housing is, is really shortchanging our future communities for up there. And small pockets of parks, they don't really offer the same, the same things, you know, of, of, I'm sure we've all remembered flying a kite with our dads, you know, and small parks don't offer that. Or running the dog. There's lots and lots of dogs up there, and the small parks just don't offer that. You know, it's more of a take your dog to the toilet. It's not an experience with your, your pets. So I really encourage you to maybe look into the future. We've got things like the Urban Eels and Perrin Park, which will be there for hundreds of years if we want them to be. If we let this go now, we've got housing for hundreds of years. And people who come to Palmerston North, we're not located in the best places, you know, we don't have people coming here. But when you go to towns, you say, they're set up, their parks are awesome here, and they're usable and great. They don't go, well, they've really set it up well for housing. So please think very carefully about, not necessarily now, because a paddock's okay for now, but we need to think what, what community-led things are going to be in the future that are going to be mint? I think that's all I need to say. Great. Thanks, James. Um, before I go to Councillor Johnson, you, you talked about um, a, a destination, a sense of place. So, um, like some previous submitters, perhaps a, a, you know, a community-led, um, whether it be another pathway at the top, could possibly come into that, like Link Later has, um, has been developed? Yes, uh, pa and pathways are good, and we've got them all through Fitzherbert, and they're awesome. They're great to use to go places and, and to adventure along those, and there's the letterboxing thing, you can find those in there, but, but the reserve op offers something different for those people who are not so agile on those walkways. Mm. Like my mum, she's, she can't get round so well anymore, and to be able to have a a park like Perrin Park, where they've put the walkway for, that the older people use from across the road, that wasn't accessible to them before. And all these walkways aren't accessible. There's steep stairs, it's a pathway, safety. Yep. It creates another space that's usable for so many more people. Okay. So a walkway up there is all good, but you still have to get to it. Yeah, sure. Mm. Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Oops. Um, thanks, James, uh, for coming in and talking to us. Um, you obviously spend a lot of time in that area, so can you comment on how well used it is? Is it, is it um, are there people there all the time? How often do you see people up, up using that um, flat area at the top? Yep. 
Um, you don't see people there all the time, but it's enough to go that it's regular and it's valued, especially for the, for the dog walkers. Um, and, and you do see kids up there as opposed to in the reserves. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't used it in the last couple of weeks because um, my dog has um, got an injury, but um, I, I really enjoy going there, and a number of people. And it just gives you, um, there's, there's more of a sense of a community, I suppose, in that part. Yeah, it is used. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Wood, online. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Kia ora, James. Uh, just a quick question as to what your thoughts are on the 3,300 square metres adjoining Pacific Drive and whether you'd be comfortable with that section being used for development or if your comments apply to both sections. Um, I'm not so concerned about the one on Pacific Drive because the size of it um, sort of limits what I would use it for personally. This is a very personal submission. So I can see the value in it for, for other people. Any open space in the city environment is worth its weight in gold. So um, I've only submitted on the 2.4 hectare area. The other area I'm not quite so concerned about for, for you know, for what will happen to it in the future. I think it's limited because of its size. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. All right. Um, thank you, James. That's, uh, that's the questions done. Appreciate your submission, and like the others, they'll be taken in our deliberation. And again, thank you for making the effort to come in and speak to us. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Right, um, our next submitter is uh, Ralph Sims. Ralph, welcome. Uh, submission number 19, it's on page 44. Um, and there is a PowerPoint for that. We'll, we'll, um, we'll get your PowerPoint up for you, Ralph. Okay, thank you, Kiara. It's good to be here. Um, I support the Green Corridor submission, obviously, because I'm wearing one of their T-shirts. So, uh, but this is a, a personal view, uh, and I've uh, so we support option one, which is I've just come up with a slogan sitting at the back there: "Preserve the Reserve." We're going to have a "Preserve the Reserve" campaign, and uh, but the question is. What do we do with the reserve? And there's been one or two comments about what it might be used for. So my um, submission is saying, well, if we keep it as a reserve, what's possible? And there's two things mainly. The, there is on the slides there, you can see the community center, which could be, um, oh, it's gone, hold on. I've now got the animations working here. So that's the community centre that I'm proposing, uh, which could be uh, large and small meeting rooms, have a library, showers, playgrounds, small car park, similar to what Hoka Fatu have got as a, uh, a community centre. And there isn't such a thing in Summerhill. Uh, a Caltry Hall is the closest if you want to go to a meeting. I was president of the Caltry um, uh, uh, I was chair, I should say, of the Cowtree Hall Committee when we funded and got um, money to build that new hall, and, uh, and it is used a lot. So we well realise the benefit of having somewhere that the community can meet, and there just simply isn't anything on this side of the river that meets that purpose. If we did that, it might need a car park. The, the grey road that you can see there is the planned development onto the uh, north of the reserve, which is uh, subject for housing development, and there's no um, doubt about that. The other thing that um, I make the point as well is um, that if you go to Plan G, the council officers have already decided that option two is better than option one because it's, uh, it's, the development has occurred on the map of Plan G. And so we're trying to say, well, let's not assume that's a development. Let's see what we can do with it. So the community centre is one component. And then there's a sports field opportunity as well. And in Plan G, I know this is a separate issue to the Addiston Reserve, but Plan G does say there is no need for sports field provision in Plan Change area, which um, here's an opportunity where we can have kids playing um, rounders or flying a kite or, or whatever else on this side of the river. And my final um, 
concept, and it's not very clear on there, is that there is an overbridge going across the road because this is raised land, and that's got a gentle slope walking down on the other side, which links the one side of Summerhill to the other side of Summerhill, and therefore near to the shopping centre as well. And that would give cycling, wheelchair, pram access all the way through, um, coming up a slope and over that road. Obviously, there's a cost in that. But if you have an, a future imagination as to what we could use as reserve for, then it could be a real hub of Summerhill. And that's my uh, point. Thanks. Thank you, Ralph. Put a thought gone into that. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll kick off. So, so the... The ramp, um, and, and uh, of course I live out there, and uh, as you know, um, and uh, that's always been an issue, getting, getting people from one side of uh, um, Summerhill to some of the amenities, uh, 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 the reserves, the walkways on the other side. And as we know, it's a busy, well, it's a state highway. Um, and I always fear for IPU students that are new to uh, New Zealand, uh, majority of them are, and they're crossing that road at their peril. So do you see the um, ramp has been quite key to, to, to everything here, and utilisation of the reserve? I think it is, and one of the ideas is if you look at, from the road, if you look at this reserve, there is a 10 metre yeah. altitude rise there anyway. Um, as well as the ramp, though, from the IPU point of view, I don't think you're going to get students walk up the road uh, onto the ramp and walk all the way back again. They'll just hop across the road anyway. So I st still think we might need a, a crossing that's there and, and uh, embellish that a bit. Uh, but certainly the ramp, the key is, I mean, the, the rest home on, on the other side, Somerset, um, folk from there could walk up to, and, and pedal up or whatever to the community hall as well. If that ramp is a gentle incline and it's suitable for just for pedestrians and, and passive um, mobility. Great, thank you. There's no other questions, so thank you Ralph and appreciate, oh sorry, there is. Councillor Harpeter. Sorry Mr Mayor, thank you. Uh, thank you Ralph. Have you socialised any of these ideas with anybody else in the community? No. Okay. No, it's um, uh, because this meeting was coming up, I uh, just got some thoughts together. Um, so, good point, though. I could do that as the Preserve the Reserve campaign. We might uh, start doing that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Barrett. Thank you, uh, Ralph, for your submission. Um, thought I'd take advantage of having a, a climate change expert at the table. Um, I guess I've had the argument put to me for reserves and, and this reserve as well that surely the best thing we could do is put a whole lot of housing there because if we don't, it means we're going to put housing even further away from the center and it's going to induce even more travel, et cetera. So can you just help me understand what responses might be to those sort of arguments? <laughs> I, I um, distinctly kept Addiston Reserve away from Plan G, and of course your question is moving into the whole of Plan G, which I have put a submission in for as well. I mean, the whole concept of reducing greenhouse gas emissions is to get a more dense, walkable community, and this is where Summerhill has got that opportunity, but Plan G, and I'm looking at the council officers here, haven't taken the emissions reduction plan into account, in my view, and, and there can be much more denser housing, more of it, without needing these few houses down on this reserve to be added to it. There's better ways to bring houses together, and, and of course there's a national government um, uh, agenda to have three-storey close proximity housing. You go to Europe, and the whole of Europe is sort of built like that, and there's every, everywhere you go, everybody cycles, walkable communities, mm. everybody knows each other. I lived in the centre of Paris for four years. I mean, I could go for a long time, but Plan G does not give us that opportunity um, in order to think what the future is going to be like under the climate change um, restrictions. So to, to clarify then, your contention is that keeping Addiston Reserve as green space 
is consistent with a, a lower emissions pathway for the it, city. It is because that's the community hub where people walk to. They don't drive into town to go and mm -hmm. have a meeting and, or, or whatever they might want to do. They can do it within their own um, walkable, cyclable area. And with, with the advent of, of more bicycles, as we know, then the whole of Summerhill could be carless if you had a really good vision for mm -hmm. it. I mean, I don't think PNCC's quite got that vision yet, but it could be, the concept could be. And I can quote you various um, uh, suburbs in, in um, uh, Freiburg in Breskau, for example, which is a carless society and people mm. are queuing up to live there. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people. And, and the car, anyway, I won't go into the details of that, but it is possible to right. have that vision that this is something different than just more suburbs as we've been doing for the last 50 or 80 years. Thank you, Ralph. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Ralph. Um, that's uh, all our questions. Appreciate your submission, as always. And uh, again, they'll be taken to our deliberations. Um, I now go to submission number 27, uh, Pacifica uh, our reference group, and uh, Courtney uh, Manu, uh, the deputy chair. Uh, welcome, Courtney. Um, it's on page 57 of your papers, councillors. Um, Courtney. Good morning, Mayor, Deputy Mayor and councillors. It's really lovely to um, be able to represent our Pacifica reference group this morning. Um, and I want to start by thanking you for making the move to create a Pacifica reference group. Um, it now allows us to have a voice at the table um, in a different way, um, given that unfortunately we do not have Pacifica representation at the council table um, moving forward into the new term. So thank you. I am Deputy Chair for the Pacifica Reference Group, and so AJ couldn't make it this morning, so um, I suppose I drew the short straw. Um, but I am excited to be here because I'm passionate about our Pacifica, and I'm a passionate um, community worker that wants to see our Pacifica go and move into more aspir aspirational spaces within our community, um, which they're currently not at the moment. Um, I unfortunately do not reside in the area that this submission is in regards to, um, but in listening to the other submissions from those that do reside and work in the area, um, thank you for your work that you do for our community and for reserving spaces like this. Um, our Pacifica Reference Group has been talking lots about housing. We're very passionate about putting our people into housing. Um, currently, homelessness um, doesn't look the same for Pacifica as it does for many. We are houseless um, by definition. Um, our Pacifica people live in overcrowding and unfortunately because of that, um, have inequitable opportunities because they cannot study within um, a safe space or within a safe household. Um, domestic violence is prevalent, but also um, our students do not have their own space to study in because they may not have a room to themselves. They may be in a room with 10 other people. Um, so for us, this submission that we have made um, is in favour, but that is specifically because we are trying to create more housing opportunities for our people to get them out of these situations. So um, after listening to the other submissions this morning, I do hear um, what you guys are saying and I do respect what you're saying. Um, we don't we have not taken those things into account, but what we are passionate about, as I mentioned earlier, is the housing aspect and creating more opportunities. What we would like to see moving forward, not just with this specific submission, um, but others, so you will see us at the table for a lot of the housing space um, discussions, is that when we are creating more opportunities for housing, that we consider the affordability, um, the people developing, and how we can talk to our community more about how we can do this together and collaborate um, in a way that makes it easier for our people to get the opportunities because um, as we've seen with Tamakuku Terraces, our people can't afford those houses. They also do not work for our people in terms of accessibility, where the houses are and um, how big they are. I mean, our people are, we live intergenerationally. We're looking for more community spaces around where we live and more transport opportunities. So yeah, I suppose our submission this morning Morning really is around the housing portion and probably less around conserving space um, but it was just a good opportunity as well to get in front of you introduce ourselves and let you know um, that we are here and um, in the short six months that we've had the opportunity to meet as a Pacifica reference group we will be here a lot more so yeah thank you 
Thank you, Courtney. Uh, appreciate you coming in. St stay there uh, if we've got any questions. Um, no, there is. A, oh, sorry, Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, Courtney, for coming in. And um, actually, it's it's really great to have this contribution. And I understand what you're saying. Um, that you um, and correct me if I'm wrong. That your submission is more about the housing need for Pacifica than necessarily about Addiston Reserve. So, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, in terms of the reserve itself, um, whether it be rezoned or left as a reserve, that's less of a priority to you than, the, than bringing the needs of the Pacifica community in front of us at the moment. Is that what you're saying? I think we would like to see more housing. Yeah. So, yes, however, um, I mean, as has been mentioned this morning already, the houses that are going to be built in that area are not going to be affordable for our people. So if the zoning was to go ahead and you are going to build houses, we're asking you to consider working harder to make things more affordable or create opportunities that allow us to get in and get some of those houses zoned towards Pacifica specifically. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Councillor Barrett. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Courtney. Um, just wondering if you could um, develop a little bit for us um, your comment towards the end where you're talking about accessibility being really important for Pacifica communities. Um, and I think the word you used around housing was where they are, how big they are, and transport opportunities. Can you just unpack that a little bit for us so we can get a sense? I was actually really hoping I wouldn't get any questions this morning. So, um, no, it's good. It's um, I suppose currently um, Pacifica people are primarily in the 4412, um, so that's where I am. Um, the reason for that is housing is affordable in those areas, whether they're favourable or not, there's a lot of social housing, so um, it's not favourable for our people, however there is accessibility around. We have Bill Brown, we have got multiple parks, we have smaller parks, um, which actually allows our families to feel safer and more secure because they are trying to protect their families from, I suppose, other situations that uh, people who come with privilege aren't trying to protect their families from. So for us, that's more secure. Um, in terms of the accessibility, living out in Summerhill or living um, in Calvin Grove doesn't make things assess accessible for us because we're stuck to timetables for bus routes, um, vehicles, um, some families only have one. So in terms of, I mean, accessibility, what we're looking for is, I suppose, what I've heard this morning is that there will be more bus routes, but those types of things to be considered in more community spaces to be built for our people within those areas. Um, so creating community hubs for Pacifica within that specific area so we're not having to go out of the area to go to the 4412. Um, and I don't like the use of the 4412 in the way that it currently is because we're creating, we're enabling our people to be stuck in an area that they shouldn't be stuck in. We, if we want our people to go further, we need to see more for our people. And to be in zoned areas like this um, would be an absolute privilege for our people. Um, and they'd be able to see what success and aspiration can look like. Currently in the 4412, I cannot say that any of you um, could see that in the 441. I mean, if you can see that in the 4412, I'd like to see where you can see aspiration in that area for our people currently. Bill Brown... Um, if you've been to, oh, I, most of you have been to Bill Brown. I saw you at the candidates' evening. Um, the area is run down. It hasn't, there's been barely any money spent on it. I know that there's a new kitchen going in at the moment, but the area is just lacking in terms of sustaining the growth of our Pacifica in this region. We can't all fit in for one Pacifica event if we wanted to collaborate and work together. So if we're not going to be able to build that area into I mean, a huge Pacifica hub, we need to consider building Pacifica hubs into other areas of the region, which then creates that accessibility and opportunity for them to be able to meet in these other areas that they don't currently have. I hope that answers your question a little bit. Not really. That is, that is helpful. I guess while acknowledging the submission, some of what you've just shared about appreciating open space, gathering for communities in places like Bill Brown that are you know, big open flat spaces. Um, is there a possibility that Pacifica families that might consider in future living um, in Summer Hill would appreciate those same sort of facilities, big open reserves in, 
in proximity to their, their homes? Yes, when you say, sorry, just to understand that, when you say big open reserves, are you talking about a hauled area? Because I think we come in droves when we do come to an event and halls are more conducive to the types of events that we're running. I mean, it's hard, hardly ever at Bill Brown are they outside doing an event. They're mostly inside the hall, you know, doing community events, running financial capability workshops, you know, those types of things. So to say that you wanted to run a event with our people for 100 people, you couldn't fit 100 people into Bill Brown. So, um, and if you did, it would be a health and safety risk. So yeah, I think creating more of those spaces similar to Bill Brown, maybe not so much with that much field area, um, would be good. We've already got Bill Brown for field area, so yeah. Great, thank you, that's helpful perspective. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Courtney. Um, appreciate uh, you uh, representing the Pacifica Reference Group um, and coming here and speaking to us. It's been really helpful. Um, and uh, we'll take your, uh, your submission um, into consideration. Um, now, We've, our final um, our final submission is uh, has something uh, that they've asked the officers to read out. So that's submission. We're going to go back to the start. Submission number thirty seven from Andrew Ward. Um, it's on page seventy of your papers, councillors. And I'll just ask Sarah to uh, to just make her way forward, and she will read out uh, Mr. Ward's verbal addition to a submission. Um, Tina Koto Katoa. My apologies for not being able to attend today's hearing, which was my intention. However, I have had to travel to Canterbury today on business. I oppose the repurposing of the Edderstone Reserve for the following reasons. Number one, there is a distinct lack of due diligence by the PNCC in understanding the current usage and patronage of the Edderstone Reserve by residents and ratepayers in the Summerhill area. In the consultation documents, the reserve is described as a 2.4 hectare of flat, land, flat area at the end of Abbey Road. This has never been developed for public use and is used to grow hay. This statement is far from the truth. The council has not developed it for public use, however the local residents and ratepayers have. It is used daily by residents for walking and exercising dogs to the extent that local residents, including myself, have cut walking tracks throughout the area to facilitate its use. This has made it more accessible to families with young children and for the elderly to, to access the screen space. I also note that you will be hearing a submission later today from Green Corridor. The work that the local residents involved with this group has greatly enhanced the local area, and with the proposed plan, much of the excellent work will be destroyed. When I raised these points with the Parks and Recreation representative at the drop-in session, he said that perhaps he should come and have a look. As part of the discovery process for repurposing of an area, I would have expected this to be an in integral first step of understanding the impact of, an any, sorry, impact of any proposed changes. Obviously, this has not been the case. Number two, I attended the drop-in sessions held on the 14th of August in the hope of gaining a clearer understanding of what the PNCC was wanting to achieve and to discuss concerns that myself and other local residents and ratepayers have, rega have regarding the repurposing um, of existing infrastructure and the local environment. Sorry, the repurposing would have had, or would have had on the existing infrastructure for the, in the local environment. I came away disillusioned by the response I received from the PNC staff present. There was a total lack of a cohesive approach to understanding the, the impacts and implications to residents and the environment. For example, I raised questions as to how additional traffic would be managed. Abbey Road is a narrow road with already restricted access for residents. There is no possibility of additional access onto State Highway 57 and there is already congestion in the morning at the Pacific Drive 
State Highway 57 intersection. Where there, oh, were there any plans to widen Abbey Road? When these points were raised, I was told by the Parks representative that he could not comment but to discuss it with the Town Planner representative. The Town Planner also told me he could not comment and then referred me to Waka Kotahi. If the PNCC is serious about communicating and engaging with residents and ratepayers, they need to provide a comprehensive plan as part of the consultation process. The PNCC is known for not responding to ratepayers' questions. There is a total lack of accountability, and the standard response is to refer you to another department. As a result, I, get, I gave up asking any further questions I had as to how rain water runoff would be managed with the with the removal of a natural catchment area if repurposing does occur. Unfortunately, the proposed repurposing of the Edderstone Reserve under the current format is another disaster waiting to happen. This project has not been comprehensively thought through and like many other developments around the city, has the potential for delays, disruptions and a lack of adequate funding due to a lack of planning. I firmly believe that the Adderstone Reserve should not be repurposed, but should be recognised as a conservation and amenity area for use by residents and ratepayers in the Summer Hill area. Nā mihi nui, Andrew Watt. Thank you, Sarah. Um, there will be no questions because we, you can't answer them. <laughs> but uh, we thank Mr Ward for um, his submission again. Um, right, councillors, that is... Uh, that is our, our schedule of submitters this morning. Um, we now go to the uh, report for this, uh, which is the uh, summary of submissions uh, around Adderstone Reserve. Um, and there's a memo uh, presented by uh, our Parks uh, Reserves uh, manager, um, Cathy Deaver Todd. That's on page 145 of your papers, councillors. Um, and welcome, Cathy and Aaron. Hop, hop along, Aaron. Welcome. Thank you, Mayors and, and councillors. Uh, Aaron Phillips, our uh, Activities Manager of Parks, um, was the person who um, ran this process, so I've got him here with me, um, and he'll take you through um, some of the, the points of it. Just, councillors, for clarity, um, for those councillors who are new, this is really just a document for information that summarises the written submissions um, and is to be considered in conjunction with the oral submissions that you've heard today. Um, another point of clarification um, for new councillors and to remind existing councillors that this is a Reserves Act process. So um, a decision to, um, to you know, consider options for um, disposal of a reserve or any part of the reserve needs to be considered under the Reserves Act. So the process here is to consult on the options to inform your decision making under the Reserves Act. Um, we have deliberately, um, you're, you're in um, directions from the earlier council resolution was to consider whether disposal of reserve or not um, was going to be form part of the developments in this area so that you could then make a decision on plan change G. Because if you were to make a decision when you get your later report um, that this on, on an option that doesn't um, align with disposal of reserve or part disposal of reserve, that would have um, implications for the future structure plan. We appreciate that has made it, um, it does make the decision making a little bit more difficult, but we are working under two separate acts, which is why it's being presented the way it has. But um, Aaron will just take you through um, the process. Uh, good morning, councillors, uh, and greetings to the new councillors that I haven't haven't met yet, um, uh, and Mr. Mayor. Um, there was an excellent level of submissions to this process, uh, in total 61. A little bit clumsy, um, as um, some of the hearing has highlighted um, this morning, and that, that we've got a plan change in conjunction or parallel with the reserve uh, process. So 46 submissions were made directly to the reserve process. We're tempted to be quite clear about the type two processes, but it is quite confusing. Um, inevitably, um, 15 submissions to re direct made directly to the Akatri plan, plan change process did have comments relating to the reserve, so we managed to capture those and incorporate that into the um, submissions that you have received 
uh, as part of the hearing and into the analysis of submissions. So we believe we've captured uh, all those who have had, had comments um, well, uh, as you'll see in the, the summary of submission document, roughly two thirds of those who submitted opposed um, any uh, uh, sale of land. There was a, a, um, a breakdown between the two portions of land that differ slightly um, in proportions, um, uh, but overall two thirds um, were opposed. Uh, the focus of those who uh, submitted an opposition has been about preserving open space and the various uh, impacts and um, relationships and opportunities that relate to that. And you've heard a lot of those points raised this morning um, and they have been um, summarised for you in the summary of submissions. Um, we're not looking to respond to those points today. Uh, Process-wise, we're here to hear any new points or elaboration of the existing points made in the written submissions uh, from the submitters that you've heard this morning. Go away, think about those and respond to them at the report that's coming to you in February, um, so that we do that in a comprehensive manner. Um, had that said, there was one point raised this morning about the, the use of proceeds for sale from land um, if it were sold. Um, you, the councillors, existing councillors, probably well aware, um, new councillors may not be aware that under the Reserves Act, if, la uh, if any land is sold, the proceeds must be used for the acquisition or development of reserves um, that's a requirement of the of the Act. Um, so just to clarify that one. Um, uh, otherwise, we look forward to reporting uh, in February in some detail about um, responding to the points raised in the submissions and taking those on board for your decision about um, what, what you wish to do. If you take questions. Great. Um, thank you, Aaron. Um, I've just got one, and uh, it... It, uh, it's on page 160 of our papers, um, and it shows the two options, option one, option two. Now, and in, in we'll call it the paddock um, part, there's, it looks like a separate title um, facing out onto the state highway, that little funny um, boxed area up the, up the top there. Is that, is that just a separate title? Is that just a, a title thing? It's part of the road reserve. So that boundary along that, that edge there is, is, comes in and out. And you, you remember, councillors, last year when we were discussing a footpath and the, the ability to fit a footpath along there, the boundaries um, along there are, come in and out, basically, there. Um, and that is part of the road reserve. But it juts right into the... Um, is it all road reserve, is it? It's a funny sort of... Um, rectangular sort of box. Oh, I, I apologise. I thought you were talking about the, the very small little piece at the end of the, um, the green reserve there. The little funny little um, rectangle box mm. off to the side. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I'd have to go away and check on that, council. Are you talking about the area that's in white with the box mm. within it at the top? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's in both of them as white. It's that's in a neighbouring reserve, and I'd have to go and check exactly what the... But it's a, is that's that in one. council ownership, isn't it? It's not believe so, but I say that slightly hesitantly without going and checking the GIS system. Could could you do that and send it to all councillors as well? I can do that Just today. Just be interested yes. to know what it is. The fact that it's been specifically ring-fenced, um, just be interesting to know what it is and if there are any fish hooks with it. Okay, um, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, I have got a question, but... I you know, you may say, well, we don't want to answer this now, we'll answer it in the report back, which is fine. But um, a couple of submitters have raised questions about um, the level of um, a research, I suppose, that was done on the use of the reserve. So would you like to address that in the report back or w would that be re addressed later? Um, yeah, I think we will address um, it in the report back. Um, however, it's it's a bit like the report that we've had recently and in, in the one that you've got coming up on um, OP Reserve, where, um, the, where the recreation is informal. When we do our user surveys, it's very difficult to ascertain the level of use. And I mean, I live up in the Summerhill area, and I know that that area is... Um, used by dog waters and people walking through, and it tends to be certain times of the day, and it's very difficult... To, um, to gauge that type of thing, and we find that in a lot of our neighbourhood reserves or unformed reserves, it's very difficult to get a gauge on that. So it's, it will be anecdotal information. But you will be addressing that in the report back? 
Yes, that we point will. That I mean, I, I think um, part of the reason we're addressing it is that the submissions have told us about some of that anec uh -huh. anecdotal information. Thank you. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Kathy and Aaron. Uh, Kathy, I just wanted to pick up on your explanation around the um, planned sequence that we all set out on some months ago here, um, which involved obviously both Addiston Reserve and um, what at that point seemed to be a longer term process around plan change G. Um, does the choice of council to go to the environment court and the ruling of the environment court regards implementation of plan change G early in any way constrain our decision making around the current process around Adderston Reserve? Um, deliberately what we've done is we've separated them out because they're two different decisions under two different acts. So it's, I bring you back to OP Reserve again, where we were really asking the councillors to say, do you want to use this reserve or part of this reserve for another purpose or not? And that's really what we're looking at here. So um, in, in terms of that, we would expect you in, in February to have made a decision under the Reserves Act that says we want to partially dispose of, dispose of, or leave it as it is on the reserve. Um, once you have made that decision, regardless of what happens in plan change G, you've made that decision about that reserve. So they are two very separate processes. Now, going to the environment court early about um, the, the structure plan, um, is, it, it, is, it is indicating that we would use that, that area um, with the structure plan as it's currently drawn for housing. However, um, the, the structure plan is indicative we haven't made a plan change yet. So you've still got a long, a long period of process like that. I mean, it's very difficult. We've, we have to, under the Reserves Act, say this is our proposal so that you can consult, so that people can say, I don't like that proposal or I do like that proposal. So we have to put something under the Reserves Act, you know, this is our proposal on the, on the line as well. So it is, it is a really difficult process. It's a good question, but it is a really difficult process. Thank you for clarifying that, Mr Mayor. Um, online, Councillor Hancock. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, thanks, Kathy and um, Aaron. Look, um, similarly to similar to uh, uh, Councillor uh, Johnson, just in terms of um, report back, um, and you may have some preliminary thoughts that you might want to share with us now, just around um, the the, um, the planting setbacks that were mentioned by Green Corridors, uh, and also the um, concerns around ground stability. So, do we have any preliminary thoughts about that that we should share now, or can share now? I think we will we will cover that off, but the, um, there's been a lot of studies in the Akautari area, and um, that is why the setback from gullies for building structures is 30 metres, because they are unstable soils. I've been involved with the Addison Reserve um, for many years in my former role here at the council, and in the early 2000s we had significant slip in that area. Um, th there's nothing to um, there's nothing to say that. Um, a setback. I mean, aside from the from the impact of the trees, um, what that what that um, setback should be, whether it should be 30 metres, 20 metres, or 10 metres, because you're really looking at are we looking at um, impacts of water? Are we looking at geotech? Now, that's a very I, I, I agree with the submitters. It's a very unstable area of land. Whether that means engineering-wise we can stable it or not, I'm not um, I'm not able to make comment on that. Yeah, thank you. And and I suppose that the, the, the other issue, which I think has sort of uh, been raised through the submissions, really is sort of, I guess, uh, concerns around sort of the balance between green space and um, and, and future housing um, expansion in the area. So, um, I I guess I don't, I'm not really sure how to make this into a, into a question, but um, I guess I have some concerns about that. Um, have we given that any sort of thought in terms of how we progress this? Uh, so that, there's a very comprehensive assessment of that as part of the development of Plan G. Um, so whilst we're talking, uh, talking about a location at a stone reserve in, in, in this report, Plan G covers um, the provision for open green space in the wider area um, and certainly the, the need for the provision of community hub. Um, all of those things were considered as part of the basis of forming Plan Change G. 
Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Cathy. Thanks so much, Mayor. Councillor Harpeter. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I think you just covered a little bit of what I was going to say, but in your report back, similar to what C Councillor Johnson asked, um, will you be doing a needs assessment for the sports field up in Summerhill? So that is part of the evidence in Plan Change G. So when we looked at it, we looked at all types of reserves. Um, historically, um, when we've done the sports fields analysis for, for the um, city, there were two things about Adderstone Reserve. As a sports field, I'm not talking about an open green space where people can kick around a ball, because they are two quite different things. But as a formal sports field, um, the topography, the soils, but mainly the location of a sports field there relative to where um, sports codes in the city need hubs in order to be able to run competitions, especially with a reduction in volunteerism. And so we're tending to clump um, codes together on sports fields. And so certainly the sports fields ana needs analysis doesn't favour a development of a formal sports field up in Summerhill per se, um, let alone at Adderstone. In the community facility, is that similar to that? Um, discussion, that analysis? Um, councillors, you'll be aware that there's a community facilities um, strategy document still underway. But the community probably aren't aware of it. Thank you. Uh, online, Councillor Wood. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and I apologise if this is the wrong time to ask this question, so I'm happy to wait to February if it is the wrong time. I just wanted to ask regarding the options that we've put to people, having read through most of these submissions, the feeling that I get is that more people take issue with the rezoning of the Abbey Road part of the reserve and less people take issue with the Pacific Drive section of the reserve. So I wanted to ask if it was possible, if any thought has been given to a possible option three where we only rezone the Pacific Drive section of the reserve. Uh, that is an option that we can bring back to you in February. Uh, Councillor Fitzgerald. I thank you, then, uh, Officer, just clarify my question. Thank you. Good. All right. That's, uh, that's the questions do done. Oh, Aaron. Uh, Mr Mayor, um, thanks to my colleague and uh, uh, Hamish on the side has brought over the GIS map of the, of the city for me, so that was very, very thoughtful. Assuming that I'm pointing at the same portion of land that you, you are referencing, which I could bring around and show you if you, if you want to be clear, that is uh, part of the reserve. It's just a, a strange parcel within the reserve. I, I have okay. delved into its history, but it is slightly odd. I accept that. Okay, good. That's all. Need to, that's clarified that. Thank you. Um, okay, councillors, we'll get the resolution up. This is around the summary of submissions for Adderstone Reserve. That council received the summary of written submissions on uh, Adderstone Reserve proposed partial reserve disposal for housing for information. I'm happy to move that. Seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Um, I'll open it up for any comments, remembering that we are just receiving these. Great. We will vote, please. And that has passed 16 votes, four none against. Thank you. All right, um, we're moving through to number seven, which is around uh, a memo there from my office uh, around appointment of council representatives to external bodies. Uh, and councillors, if I could perhaps just uh, take that as obviously being read, uh, and it's been well um, circulated um, with you. If I could just say, really, this is around just maintaining and enhancing those um, partnerships that we have with city organisations across a number of sectors, and uh, they're broken down into community groups, community trusts, um, project um, uh, steering or uh, program user groups, um, other local authority groups, um, which are majority managed by Horizons, our, our regional council colleagues. And you'll see attachment one contains um, the nominated councillors for, for each body. Just wanted to draw your attention to um, 2.5 and that I, in the new year I'll be bringing back um, recommendation on 
three steering or user groups um, to look at several big projects that we're working through. One is around the Nature Calls Adaptive Management um, program, and in speaking to officers, they found this quite helpful that if we did have some elected member, a continued elected member um, representation there. The two other projects, which one is uh, very much longer and medium term, is this uh, Civic and Cultural Master Plan and where that goes, and, uh, and the next one is the Streets for People, which is very much now uh, and short term. And really these are around, we've seen um, user groups and steering groups um, really get things done and certainly keep elected members um, informed and engaged. Uh, also number three is around uh, appointment of a liaison councillor to the village and rural communities. And um, this is quite important. Um, we've seen that in different um, areas of engagement with some of our communities, our more rural and uh, village um, based communities. So. Uh, residents of Ashurst, Bunnythorpe, Linton and Longburn, perhaps with more of a, um, an element towards Ashurst and Bunnythorpe um, interaction with council. Um, officers certainly uh, do their work there, uh, but it's important that elected members are in that space too. So I've nominated Councillor Hancock to that position to attend relevant meetings, and he's uh, gracefully uh, accepted that, which uh, I thank him for. Um, of the Appendix 1, um, there was one change, and I'm just going to it. It was around uh, the Manawatu or um, Malgra, the Manawatu Lesbian and Gay Rights Association, and changing out um, our councillors there from Councillor Wood to Councillor Johnson. And I believe both councillors have spoken with each other on that. Um, and we'll, um, we'll look to just note that change if officers could. Um, with that in mind, I'll, I'll open it up. Uh, well, first of all, I'll, I'll look to move that. And if I could have a second before that. Thank you, Councillor Naylor. And then I'll open it up for... Um, so we've got here the appointment of council representatives to external bodies. Resolve that uh, the council approve the mayor's recommendations for appointment of council representatives to external bodies attachment one, and number two that uh, the council approves the mayor's recommendation for appointment of councillor Pat Hancock as liaison councillor for villages and rural communities, and we've just added the amendment there to attachment one. Um, all right, I'll open it up for um, any comments or questions or comments, um, councillor Johnson. Um, yeah, I suppose it's a comment, so I should probably stand. Um, so I just wanted to say that I think that this very long list um, gives an indication of how much interaction there is between elected members and different community groups. And um, sometimes I know people say, oh, you know, uh, councillors are not really well connected or whatever, or they're, they're not understanding what's going on. But I think when you look at a list like this, and um, I mean, from my sort of, Know, limited appearance on it. I know the amount of work that's involved in the groups that I'm assigned to. Um, and when you multiply that up around the table, that's a huge amount of extra um, community work and liaison that's going on. So I, I just thought it's worthy of comment uh, because um, it's actually a substantial uh, workload probably for the councillors that are involved and I think it needs to be acknowledged. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I concur. I think... Um, uh the public would be um, uh, quite amazed that there's nearly 40 groups here that we um, have um, regular interaction with. And I'd like to say that I think we just saw in action this morning how the value of the Pacifica uh, reference group uh, where Courtney came in. Courtney's well known to some of us um, in the Pacifica community, but it's uh, great to see uh, them having a voice or standing up and having a voice for us. And we wouldn't have that as much um, if we didn't have a reference group. And that's the same for um, seniors, and we've seen it with the disability um, sector as well. So th that's just the value of having these organisations and having a, a seat around the table. So there's no other uh, uh, comments, so we'll ask, I'll ask you to vote, please.
And then it's passed 15 votes for and none against. Thank you. All right, councillors. Um, we'll have a small break. Um, and for those online, we'll be back online at, uh, at quarter to 11. Thank you.
Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, welcome back, um, councillors. Uh, and we will resume our meeting. Uh, we now go to number eight in our order of business. And this is on page 171 of your papers, councillors. This is around our quarterly, although in this term, it's a, in this case, it's a four-month performance and financial report for the period ending the 31st of October 2022. Um, I know Cameron, uh, CFO, will be presenting. I'm just a bit unsure who's coming with him. Andrew and Sue. So, um, welcome people, and uh, you know the drill, so the floor is yours. Kia ora tato, uh, Mr Mayor and councillors. Um, as the Mayor has outlined, this is a little bit different. It's not strictly a first quarter report. Uh, we've taken, taken the opportunity to take it out to four months, given the break over the election period, so you had the most uh, recent of information that we could provide. I just want, before I, uh, before I continue, um, I did, uh, we have noted that there is a typo uh, on one of, the pa uh, one of the pages, and I just want to correct that. Um, for you so that you're aware of what that is. So that's on page 223. And it's under the revised budget column. The employee remuneration under the revised budget column should read 57250, and the other expenses should read 43600. Uh, um, that was a, a, a genuine uh, error that we picked up. Um, and we do apologise for that. Now, in terms of what, uh, for, uh, particularly for, for our new elected members, this report uh, serves as, as basically to provide performance and monitoring oversight over the delivery of our, of our annual budget and, and plans for the year. Um, it highlights how we're tracking against budget, how our capital delivery is progressing, um, and it also highlights how we're, uh, how we're tracking against our uh, non-financial performance indicators. So it, it is a fairly comprehensive report um, and, and does cover a multitude of things, and that is why with me, I have two officers from different parts of the organisation to help cover the non-financial and capital aspects of the report. Overall, in terms of uh, how we're tracking uh, operationally, we, we are uh, tracking not, uh, not too bad. We, uh, we are la uh, roughly within the, the full council budget um, for, the, for the four months. But I just want to to take the opportunity to really talk about some of the th things that we're seeing that's starting to impact on us. I think many of you will be aware of the, the national and global economic situation. Uh, things are starting to become more expensive to, uh, to pot, uh, buy and service, and uh, our interest rates are also increasing. So you're starting to see some of the effects of the, the rising interest rates already coming through in this report. Um, that's, uh, that's something that, that we are continuing to monitor and we've mitigated the full effect of, of interest rate rises where we can, as you heard last week, by utilising um, fixing through swaps. But of course, anything that's, uh, that's floating will, will have a direct correlation as interest rates move, so we probably will see that that will be a problem when we come to the end of the year. Uh, we are seeing, uh, we've seen already that we've got in, uh, increases in, in electricity and insurance, so uh, we've recently gone out and retended the electricity co uh, contract and that came back being more expensive um, than the existing contract, so that's not factored in the current budget 
and that is something that we um, we will see as an effect through this year. So just want to highlight to you some of these things that, that we are seeing at the moment. Uh, there is a couple of requests uh, in this in this report to to reallocate some budgets. I just want to talk to those before I pass them on. So, when we set the budget in the first of uh, first of July, at the same time the infrastructure unit had a reorganisation where the three waters were and roading were separated. It's taken us a little while just to understand the overhead impacts of that and ensure that we reallocate the overhead aspects of those activities appropriately. So, so that is one portion of the reallocation. We, we also had a um, decision to reduce the draft remuneration budget and we put it in into one of the bigger activities in, in infrastructure to start with. And now that we have assessed where the vacancies lie so we can apply it correctly, we've reallocated that, uh, that out to the various activities. The, the net effect of both is, is zero, um, but something that we need to, to put through to, to ensure that our systems report and track correctly. The other budget uh, variation request that we, uh, that we have in the recommendation the National Transition Unit, as part of the Three Water Reform, uh, has, uh, has put out some funding for councils. Um, basically what that funding is for is in recognition of the extra work required in, in responding for requests for information uh, and assisting through that process. So that budget uh, line that's been created is 825,000, which is a which is the funding that we have received. So that's, that's been requested for as well. Um, without further ado, I'll pass you over to Sue, who will talk to you a little bit about capital delivery to date. Thank you. Sorry, good morning. So in terms of uh, capital delivery, uh, I think the illustration with the pie charts um, gives a good indication of uh, the progress uh, to date. Um, slightly slow start in July, owing to some of the, um, the wet weather at the time, but as the weather has improved, the pace has picked up on site. Um, and at um, the end of October, we had 82% um, of our um, projects, of our 376 projects, underway for the year. Um, Officers uh, are in the process of regularly updating their cash flow forecasting. And one of the things that we're doing um, very actively is looking at identification for any early carry forwards while still trying to mitigate the effects of whatever might be causing those delays. So we've, those are included and they're identified as indicative carry forwards because while those are pro active programs of work, it's um, difficult to be precise around those, but it's certainly giving you an early heads up as to what's happening. Um, <clears throat> we're also uh, pleased to report that the design panel is being well utilized. We have um, 19 designs that have been completed to date. Uh, there's a whole package of work that's underway, and we're actually starting um, for the designs for the 23-24 um, year. Um, part of that is around progressing to um, faster starts in um, a July time. So uh, I'll hand back to Cam. Uh, hello, elected members. I'll just give you a brief introduction to the traffic lights part of the report, particularly for new members. So that's uh, the part starting on page 188. And these are the indicators that come from the LTP, and they're used to show residents whether or not we're doing a good job in providing our services. Um, traffic lights, green means good, Yellow and that we're on track. Yellow means that we're not on track but expect to get back on by year end. And red means not on track and unlikely to get back on track. So at the very least, a way to look at this report is to be aware of the, the breadth of the green items and to look more closely at the yellow and red items. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you. Um, a few, few questions in the line. Um, before I go to my colleagues, uh, probably around the, the traffic lights, um, page 189, just around um, performance measures, uh, around city growth, um, and uh, we're, we're, in, we're in the red, and I, I'm hoping we're going to get into an orange or a, or a green at some stage, but uh, just around the measure around enough land, land or, or, or uh, opportunity to to um, to create housing, um, is is there a comment there around? We've got here it says here spade ready greenfield growth capacity is almost fully exhausted, um, and a couple of our projects are being delayed. Um, obviously, Tamakuku will affect some of that, but if I could just have an officer comment a bit. How we're going to how we're going to cope with things in in the short term? I know I'm, I'm re relatively co confident you've got it sorted medium and longer term, but short term. Uh, yeah, through you, um, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so as you know, there's a, a significant work program um, of rezoning proposals for the medium to long term um, in terms of intensification, Kakatangiata, Kotiri, Ashurst, uh, Roxburgh Crescent, in the I guess in the short to medium term, uh, we are indicating that there is some extreme pressure. What we're seeing is that, you know, even if we rezone land, um, that doesn't immediately uh, mean that it is available for development. So Fokoronga was uh, rezoned in 2015, um, and we're still working through some of the infrastructure issues to enable that development to occur. Uh, Kiki Whenua has been uh, rezoned for a couple of years now. I uh, had a meeting earlier this week to look at ways in which we can accelerate uh, with the developer and uh, connecting with the infrastructure team to look at ways in which we can accelerate the infrastructure provision to Kiki Whenua. I'm aware there's a report coming to Council shortly in terms of the Whakaronga stormwater situation. Um, so I guess I can assure you that the team are looking at all ways possible to particularly advance Whakaronga and Kiki Whenua. Uh, we are hamstrung a little bit by the uh, state highway network, particularly at Kiki Whenua. Um, indications from Waka Kotahi are uh, that they, uh, at this stage, are, are not supportive of a speed reduction at Pioneer Highway or State Highway 56. Uh, we'll be raising that again uh, formally with Waka Kotahi because um, at the current speed, that requires a substantially different type of infrastructure at Tiwanaka Road, Pioneer Highway, than what would otherwise be delivered if it was a slower speed. And as Council know, the proposal is to urbanise that entire area. So. Um, the chicken and egg scenario is playing out in real life. Um, so, look, a relatively long answer, sorry, but it is an important issue. Uh, and as I said, we're directing as much resource as we can or have available to that medium to long term solution and uh, looking at ways um, to, to relieve that pr pressure short term. We are seeing the market move towards more um, intensification. There's some good things that come from that. Uh, we've had a couple of open days recently on that intensification, a lot of interest as well. So. So David, we'd be putting our efforts, just a follow up question, we'd be putting our efforts into Kiki Whenua and Whakarongo to, to, um, to try and uh, backfill some of that greenfield and I appreciate the um, brownfields or intensifications actually happening naturally, but in terms of greenfields, because that, that is a big part of the market as well. Yeah, that, you know, between Whakarongo and Kiki Whenua you've got near on, you know, land for 700 to 800 sections. Um, if we can resolve the serving, servicing issue, then they're, they're available to the market. Uh, Great. As you know, we're proposing another 1,000 sections at Okotiri, but again, similar to Kiki Whenua, the State Highway intersects, um, th where that connects with the State Highway is, is going to require some careful conversations with Waka Kotahi. So it'd be fair to say we're going to bring our, our, roading, our national roading partner agency with us. Yes, they have submitted on the Akotiri plan change um, and, and those issues will be resolved through the hearing, but um, um, there's yeah, some conversations to occur in that space. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Harpeter. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, team, for the report. Um, my first question is around Cuba Street and just wanting an um, update on where it's up to, what date do you think it'll be completed? So uh, the plan is to have the road uh, fully open uh, hope the 16th of December, but at that point there will be still some works to com come back and complete in the early new year. Um, <clears throat> it was uh, 
felt that it was advantageous to have a road fully open and parking available for businesses just prior to Christmas. And is it uh, in budget? It's, it is in budget. Okay, thank you. Yes. Second question, thank you for that. Second question is around the Civic and Cultural uh, Precinct Master Plan. Um, David. Um, just wondering where we're up to with that. I see you, we've had a workshop back in um, the 31st of August. Just wondering where we're up to with that. What's our next step? Uh, the, I, I can update Council that there's currently no work occurring um, on, on the Civic and Cultural Precinct Master Plan. Uh, we're uh, in the process of concluding some um, conversations with the current consultancy provider. Um, so at this stage we don't anticipate that the current provider will continue um, with the contract to complete the work um, and we'll be reporting back to Council in the new year with some options uh, for the future of that project. And my third question is around the Civica, which is um, uh, the, that project. I just wanted to know if we could get an answer on where that's up to. Get through, Mr Mayor. Uh, that project is progressing. Um, there, there's a number of staff throughout the organisation at the moment going through um, configuration and data, data migration sort of processes to, to bring our data across. Uh, it is it is on uh, on track at this current time, um, and and there's quite a bit of work going on behind the scenes as well to to hit the first of July deadline. Is it on budget? It is within budget. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I've got uh, two areas of question. Um, the first one is about the resident survey on page 208. Um, so I just, um, there is some commentary about um, the drop in satisfaction level, um, but I wondered if we could just expand that a little bit and maybe um, have some comments from officers about um, what the next steps would be to address some of those issues that came out in that survey. Thank you. So in terms um, particularly about the resident satisfaction with engagement, the ongoing work to get community engaged through projects like the LTP, where we've got the ongoing engagement rather than just looking at the, the submissions at the, towards the end of the process. And a lot of work getting people engaged and interested in the council online. So are we planning to do anything differently, Andrew? So for the LTP, yes, we are intending to do a lot more of the early and ongoing engagement. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my other question is around uh, the comments about the reduction in the remuneration budget on page 186. I'll just get that up. Um, so, could, can I confirm what the remuneration budget was for the previous financial year? I, I don't have the number in front of me, but I know the increase to the to the total remuneration budget was four point eight million from memory. Yes, that that was my understanding as well. So, um, why is it then on page one hundred and eighty six that um, it's characterised as a two million dollar reduction in remuneration budget? Yeah, um, to, to answer that question, what that's trying to reflect is um, the, uh, the decision to, uh, in the draft to the final, we, uh, we had an increase of 6.8 million requested and we made a decision to reduce that by, by 2 million to, and that was reflective um, 
in the comments around the vacancies that the organisation was was currently holding. So to be a bit more realistic with with the increase. So. So what I don't understand then is if the overall remuneration budget has increased by 4.8 million, uh, why is this commentary around vacancies putting pressure on staff, et cetera? Through your worship, I'll, um, I'll see if I can uh, cover this one off. Um, I'll, I'll take you. Uh, can I take your uh, points on notice, uh, Councillor, as well? I, I clearly understand uh, um, your question in relation to this matter, um, and I think that we just uh, uh, the way that uh, uh, perhaps some of the um, items have been phrased um, in the report uh, uh, could have been addressed a, a little bit um, uh, better in that regard. Does that make sense at all? Um, yes, it does, thank you. Um, I guess um, I'm, I'm keen to make sure that there isn't a narrative. Well, I suppose this is a comment. I'll save that, thank you. Apologies, Mr Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Naylor. Thank you. Um, thanks for the report. Um, <clears throat> firstly, just I've got a few questions, if that's OK. Just starting, <coughs> excuse me, on page... 175 at the um, operating performance table. Um, I, I was a little bit confused to begin with because I'm mostly the reporting has the deficits in brackets and the surplus not in brackets, but this table seemed to be the other way around, which confused me for a little bit. Is there a reason why it's the other way around on this table? Yeah, so in this table, it, it is presented in a way, um, in a, in basically an accounting sort of way, where, where in accounting sense, revenues are, are credits and, and expenditure is debit. So if you've got more revenue than expenditure, um, at the bottom line, it creates a surplus, which shows as, a, as in brackets. So that's, that's the um, way in which the, the, those sort of statements come through, but we could look at perhaps trying to alter that. Okay, so just to clarify, the um, move from the 131 at the bottom of that, um, that was a small surplus, moving to the 639 that doesn't have the brackets around it, actually is moving us into a deficit, that's correct, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so that's good. I just wanted to clarify that, because at a initial glance I thought it looked good but then I as I looked at the other reports it didn't seem consistent with well not good but um, okay thank you sorry that's comment um, so just I think Councillor Johnson has raised the other issues which I won't repeat um, just moving to oh yeah I did have another question on that same chart the operating expenses increasing from 119.8 million to 121.3 million is about a $1.5 million increase. And certainly there's some commentary around the increase in electricity and insurance, which factors around half a million of that. Where in our report would we find um, reason for that other perhaps million dollars increase in operating expenditure? Uh, perhaps I can con carry on, because... Um, I think the, so moving to page 209, um, so that's where I would have normally looked on that activities operating net result, because that's also the bottom line has an increase of 1.5 million there. But where that's complicated is that all of the changes outlined in Appendix 9 have also been applied to that. Um, statement. So I'm just really struggling to. I'm seeing that we've got a, about a 1.5 million dollars increase, but I'm really not being able to find the reason for that. So just to clarify, uh, Councillor, you're you're referring to 1.5 million dollar increase in the revised budget. Yeah. Right. So the uh, the increase. Um, 
in the, in the revised budget is more covered under Appendix 8. So one of the, one of the key increases in there um, was the increase in the operating program budget for the um, ozone replacement, which, which was taken, uh, brought to you earlier on in the year, um, along with a few other items. So I did look at Appendix 8, but that looked like it was an overall decrease of about 700. Yeah, I know there's a lot of items in there, but it, it only adds up to about 700,000. The reason for that is, bec uh, is because within there, uh, there are revenue items and, and also expenditure items. So some of the rev revenue items that you see in there are revisions to the revenue budgets in the, in the original table you were looking at. Okay, thank you. Um, just um, going back to page 223, which was the page that had the error, um, you, meant, you, you said that the remuneration was fi um, 57,250. What did you say that the other expenses had increased to? Was it 43 million something? 43,600. And what, where would we find the reason for that increase in other expenses? Would that just be the same thing that you've yes. referred to? Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, online, uh, Councillor Wood. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and I have a number of questions relating to our non-financial performance measures. Um, so I wanted to start off on page 189 regarding uh, measure two, our resource consent applications. We see here that almost half, 45% of our resource consent applications aren't being processed or weren't processed in the statutory timeframe. Um, I wanted to ask what was the reason behind that and more importantly, I guess, what resources, you, you make some comment here that additional resources in the team will likely increase that percentage. I would like to know what resources you need from this council to have confidence that will increase that measure to anywhere near the target, because 45% not being processed is a very concerning figure to me. Look, the, uh, the Chief Customer Officer is um, not here today and, and looks after resource consent. Uh, but what I can say is there has been some uh, structural changes made recently to the resource consent team. So they have introduced uh, for the first time a uh, manager, a, dis uh, a specific resource consent manager, um, and, a, and a new principal planner role. Um, that's intended to allow the technical experts to uh, focus on the consent uh, while the, the manager is, um, I guess, looking at those systems and process improvements um, and team performance. So I know that is one change that has been made. There's a number of technology um, um, opportunities that are being looked at in, in the customer space as well, um, similar to the building consent where you can lodge those resource consents online, monitor them throughout the process um, and look at where those delays are. There's regular reporting into the executive leadership team in terms of that resource consent space, so um, those are some of those uh, the, the key areas that we're looking at at the moment, but um, clearly in the, um, an area for focus and improvement. Thank you for that. Um, so is there anything more that we can be doing as a council to support you in that in terms of resources, technology or staffing, or are you comfortable with the direction we're heading to get us back toward that target? I think at this stage we have the resources that we need, so I talked um, about those those changes that we've made. Um, the technology changes uh, have been prioritised uh, through the business steering group and the use of the digital transformation budget, so that, that, uh, pro that project is uh, uh, yeah, progressing. Um, at present. All right, thank you. Um, can I move to page 192 in a different line of questioning? Um, under transport measure one, we have a goal of fewer um, serious or fatal crashes in the previous year. And looking at these figures, uh, there were 36 crashes in, 20, or in this year and 37 the year before. We've classed that as being on target. I just wanted to ask our officer's opinion of whether or not a decrease in one fatal or serious crash is really enough to justify being on target. Uh, that, that indicator is um, a narrative measure. So we have put in there the numbers and talked about what's happening in terms of the text. And yes, um, 
given that if we didn't have it as green, that would be off track. Uh, yes, I think um, green is appropriate. The indicators often are very blunt, which is quite why we quite often use the narrative measures, which allow us to tell a bit more of the, the detail about it. All right, thank you. And my final question is on page 202 regarding our total organisational emissions. Um, so in here we state the Low Carbon Fund has enabled substantial further emission reduction. Um, my question was, do we have a figure amount that we can attach to that, given that other measures have had quite small decreases and being counted as on track? I'd be interested in what the actual reduction is. Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, from memory, the corporate, so the, um, the low carbon fund is primarily um, or almost entirely directed at our corporate emissions. Um, from memory, our corporate emissions have reduced 24% uh, uh, from, uh, from the baseline. I'd have to go back and check the baseline year, but there has been a, um, a substantial reduction in our corporate emissions. We have indicated in previous reporting that we've sort of tackled the low hanging fruit, um, and the low carbon fund is intended to support some of those more challenging. Uh, decisions that we have going forward. But I, I can circulate uh, f uh, f uh, for you the, the previous reporting on the corporate emissions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Also online, um, Councillor Hancock. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr Mayor. I've, I've just got um, two uh, areas of interest. Uh, the first one should be uh, fairly, uh, fairly quick. Um, just on page 175, there's commentary there around um, an increase of unbudgeted uh, funding for insurance premiums of 300k. Can we just get um, some uh, commentary, please, just in terms of the drivers of that, and, um, and and is there anything in there which is controllable for us, please? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we go through an uh, go through an annual premium renewal every year where we work with with a broker to try and obtain the best uh, best packages for council. Now, the insurance industry as a whole um, has, has been going through a period of um, significant premium increases uh, right across all sectors, um, reflecting the, the increase in the number of events, um, particularly natural events that, that have occurred in New Zealand. And we, we unfortunately do end up becoming a price taker in that, in that realm. We are currently going through discussions around renewal at the moment and are assessing what what other options could we consider uh, in the insurance space to mitigate the premium increase and, uh, and whether there is anything that we can do and what level of risk as a council we would be prepared to take for that saving and premium. So we are currently working on that at the moment. Uh, thank you, Cam. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's helpful. Um, and the second uh, area of interest really is just around uh, program uh, 1512 on page uh, 222, and that relates to the um, CCTV replacement uh, program. Um, can I get an update on how that program is progressing? Um, and also some commentary in terms of how that will progress in terms of scale up from what we've previously had, please. So uh, that program um, to date, so uh, so this this month has seen some more uh, invoices being paid in, in that program. So we've actually now spent 134,000 of that, and we have got committed to spend um, uh, up, uh, I think up to about 450,000 at this current point in time. So uh, the program is is progressing. Um, and is intended to be delivered this year. We have had a few delays in terms of in terms of shipping and supply chain, but but we are uh, we are confident that we will um, meet the objectives of that program this year. Yeah, thank you. And just in term, so in terms of what we are what we are planning, is that scaled up? on what we have had previously within the CBD? Um, I, uh, I would have to just confirm exactly uh, what what is in the plan, but my understanding is 
uh, uh, it is scaling up on the CCTV side of um, our investment in the, around the CBD, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you, Cameron. Look, I, you know, I suppose um, it, it would be very helpful perhaps just to get an update on that, uh, particularly around sort of reassurance to the community in the particular climate that we're facing at the moment. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, um, Cam and Sue and um, Andrew. Uh, a few questions. Um, firstly, around any activity in the urban speed limits review space. We had some a couple of years ago now, it seems like, and it seems like it's just gone entirely silent since. So if we could get an update on what activity is underway there. Yeah, I can make a general comment and then I may ask um, Gina McDonald, our strategy and policy manager, to add to that. Um, so there has been a whole lot of changes to um, I guess the national framework for managing speed um, and we are having to develop a, 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 a new speed management plan for the entire city um, which is going to um, I guess in, inform those future decisions as opposed to just sort of being reactive through the bylaws space so I don't know whether there's anything else you want to add Julie. Councillors, councillors um, through you, Mr Mayor, the, the answer is what David said, um, but also that um, a briefing is coming through to you um, through the councillor updates this week about um, a proposal for the risk council's response to the new law and how we're required to set speed limits, and I think the proposal is that we do a, an interim um, set of measures which will involve schools and the CBD or the, the city centre and then the full plan that we're required to do, um, so that is coming to you this week. Thank you. Can I just follow up? Would there be any estimate of when we might see implementation then in the city centre or around schools? We'll make sure that we've got time frames on that and then update them to, to hand. Thank you. Um, next question is just around the KPIs overall. Um, a lot of them show just a huge bounce back from, you know, the depths of COVID basically. Is, is there potential in the next cycle of this report to include some, some pre-COVID um, comparators as well so we can see a little bit of um, yeah, what the new normal might be looking like relative to pre-COVID times? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, a couple of questions on specific uh, indicators as well. Um, page 192, um, measure number two is the top there, it's one of the economic development uh, activities. Talks about achieving a, a positive city reputation. Just give you a moment to get to page 192. And, and to my reading, it, it presents two quite contrasting pieces of evidence. The, the kind of media space where we appear to be doing quite well, and then our residence space where we are not doing so well and then we've given ourselves a green um, as, as a rating of that. And so I wanted to query how we are balancing that kind of external reputation in the media versus the local reputation with the people that choose to live and work in this city. The, the balance in that case was more about the the more objective media figures against the um, the resident survey report, which we think has been affected by COVID. But it, it was, I mean, you're right, it was an area that was, was hard to, to put into green or yellow, because part of it was good and yeah, part of it not quite so. Right. Time so, you, am I hearing that you're saying the the resident survey wasn't an objective analysis? No, but it was affected. The results seem to have been affected by COVID quite a bit. Whereas the the council hasn't changed what it's doing, but the resident sort of base satisfaction or mood has dropped. Thank you for. 
that response. Um, might move on. Page 208. I think Councillor Johnson had some, some query in this area as well. Let's get there myself. Um, so this is around people's satisfaction with um, being able to um, have the opportunity to have a say as well as the ease of doing it. Um, and it seems like the, the response that's articulated in, in the comments there is around kind of a further focus in online engagement. I just wonder how we're validating um, the actual needs of the community before we move to um, specific responses. So when we, in the past, we've asked residents about how they want to engage with the council, online is uh, the, the main um, method that they would like us to use. And, and is that when we ask people online if they want to be engaged with online, they tell us they want to engage online, or are we asking people offline if they want to transition to online engagement? Um, it, it's a common um, it's, it's a common feedback we get is that online engagement is the easiest way of doing it for them. Yep, um, I can't point to any particular survey or bit of feedback that shows that. Um, could I help? So I'll Assist just. With that? I'll let it go first, Donna, and then then you can jump in if I get it wrong. The um, uh, I think there's some opportunities there, uh, Councillor, as well, uh, particularly as we lead up into the new LTP and we go out to do engage with the community as well about uh, uh, what they might like to see in their LTP. I think that uh, some of the questions that that have been outlined today are good um, examples of actually picking those up and and asking those questions of people face to face when we're actually meeting with them as well. There's some opportunities there. Uh, Donna Baker, Acting Chief, Chief Executive Unit Manager. <laughs> do remember what it is. Um, just to help perhaps with that, when we do go out to the community and we do go out to um, drop-in centres and public meetings and we were engaging, if you remember, through the election period where we were doing um, sausage sizzles, etc., we do have uh, wider range of conversations with people around how they want to engage with us. And when we look at the submissions, even that have come through for um, the recent plan changes and the reserve um, conversation, People are given the opportunity to come back to us in hard copy or in um, online, and more than two thirds are coming back through the online submissions. So the information that we're getting from our community is that majority are wanting to talk to us online. However, we always give um, the community the opportunity to come back to us um, in a uh, written form or through the phone or through email, however they want to. So we are adaptive around the way that we communicate. There are some things uh, that we do that are particularly focused online. However, there are also things such as the drop-in centres, which where we have written collateral, um, there are opportunities for people to fill in forms and to come back to us in whichever way they want to. So we really are trying to take the community um, views and how they want to uh, communicate with us on, you know, in all of the ways that we communicate with them. So there are always options. It's never just online. Um, social media has grown, but we don't rely just on social media. We still do paid advertising. We still do public um, advertising. And we still do radio. So, and we do letters, um, drop-ins, and a lot of engagement where we're actually going and talking to the community and stakeholders. I hope that helps. Great. Thank you for those um, answers variously to all three of you. Um, I think the final area that I'll have questions for, at least at this stage, um, centers on page 230, um, which is more in the financial space um, and addresses the, um, the reallocation of overheads. Um, so 
So I'm just trying to find it myself. There we go. Around the future fit column, I'm trying to understand what one might take away um, from that. Um, it, one thing that occurs to me is that we might take away that the transport space was in broad terms cross-subsidizing the water space. Is, have I got that at all right, or is that the wrong way to look at that? Uh, through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mia. Um, previously, previously, there was a, a combined activity that had trans, uh, transportation and the three waters uh, combined. And when the, uh, when the two activities were separated, um, there, uh, there needed to be work completed to understand how then to reallocate the non-controllable costs or the overhead costs um, effectively. And, and that didn't occur until after the budget had been set. So now that the budget's been set um, and we've done that piece of work, what we're saying is we would like to allocate the overheads to the correct activities to give a more correct reflection of the total cost of the activity rather than it all stays sitting in, well, the bulk of it stay, staying sitting in roading, which was the, the, the big part of the combined activity previously. Thanks. So is this then a, a recent artifact, basically, of, of those changes rather than a historic kind of long-term cross-subsidy cross type scenario? Yeah, it's, um, when they were combined as one one group, um, the, it was able to be allocated through the activities um, effectively, but, but when we separated them, mm. then we identified that actually we needed to correct the overhead allocation to reflect the, the, the services being provided. So at the, moment, at the moment, the way it's sitting is the overheads are unfairly hitting more of the transport uh, space after that re, uh, restructure of the activity. Um, what we're trying to do is to reallocate um, the overheads across the activities that used to be part of that combined group. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Isabella. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your reports. I have two, possibly three questions. Um, the first just relates to you were you were talking about the electricity contract and increasing costs that are coming with that. Is that for the operation of the CAB solely? Uh, no, that uh, that is all of council's electricity usage. Um, so, I think back in September. Uh, we we had to go out and renew the electricity contract that council held, and the pricing that came back was different. And it's for all of all of council's activities, not just CAB. And thank you. And what what bearing, if any, do the solar panels on the CAB have on that uh, escalating costs or potential to reduce escalating costs? That, uh, that's a good question uh, that, uh, that I might not be technically able to answer. I'll pass you to Bryce. Thank you. Uh, Bryce Hosking, Acting Chief Infrastructure Officer. Uh, the simple answer is very little, if any. Oh, thank you. Um, my second question, uh, I'm on page uh, two, 203. I'm looking at climate change, uh, eco-city goals there. Looking at measure three. I just noted under measure three, it says that additional plantings of native uh, flora, uh, flora in the flood protection zone are limited at best and always will be in the foreseeable future. I'm wondering if you can uh, explain a little about those limitations, just for my information. 
Hi, Cathy Deeper Todd, um, Group Manager, Parks and Logistics. The um, flood protection area is under the control of Horizons. Um, the planting of trees and shrubs in a flood protection area does have an impact on the way the water moves during a flood. Mm. Um, and some of the things that you can get with that is that a tree or a shrub can cause an eddy to build up around it and scouring out. Therefore, Horizons are very reluctant for us to do any planting within the flood protection area. Thank you very much. And my final question uh, is relating to page 227 and just referencing Councillor Wood's comments earlier about the low carbon fund. I just noted that it said there was no allocation that's been made from this fund to, uh, to 31st October. Is that just for this financial year or for the entirety of the fund? Just this financial year. Great. Good. That's all for me. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Finlay. Thank you. Yeah, I have three questions all along the same area, but it's on page 163. Something I've taken a bit of note, uh, interest in as it's been going over for a while is the owner's own replacement. Um, the three question is, um, how are we going with the revised budget? Are we within budget? Yes, we are. Good. Second question is, um, are we going to be ready on the 1st of um, <coughs> um, July next year to switch over? At this point in the project, I can say we're on track, yes. And the third question is, um, staff training, how are we looking at, because was there going to be a huge changeover in the whole, whole um, of the system? How are, is our staff training going? Are we looking at starting that? Have we started it? Or what's going to happen there? Uh, so we, uh, we are starting to ramp up in the change management space. Um, so this phase of the project has been more around the, uh, the data migration and configuring um, various modules within the new system. Um, when we come back in the new year, we will be uh, we will be going into a phase of testing and then training. So uh, through this next period will be the period in which we'll be ramping up efforts in that space. So hopefully everything on the 1st of July will go bang, we'll be away. Well, the intention will be for it not to not to go uh, not to fall over, but for it to be to be running um, as we would like on the 1st of July. I mean, these, these projects, these system changes, we'll have a few teething problems, no doubt. So I presume the two systems will be running parallel for, for a period of time? We won't immediately switch off um, ozone um, until, until we're confident everything's running because we want to make sure that we can keep the lights on, so to speak. Yep. Um, uh, but the intention will be that that after that initial go live period that we work work through how we switch that off um, and ensure that we've actually covered everything that it currently does. Very good. Thank you. Councillor Naylor. Thank you. Sorry, just one more question I forgot to ask earlier, and that relates to um, resourcing, which is outlined on page 186. Um, thank you for that table, by the way. It's much clearer than what we've had in the past. Um, I just was... Um, ref Note that um, the comments around carrying vacancies um, and the pressure that that's putting, putting on staff. Um, I'm just wondering, and also how we fund um, the, the FTE that we approve through the annual budget. Um, I, I mean, when we did the annual budget process, we were all well aware that there were a large number of vacancies and there was an acknowledgement that those may not be all filled on, on day one. Um, are, are all of the all of the um, FTE allocation that's outlined in, in, on this chart funded in within the year, or are we actually needing to hold vacancies in order to break even, or to to meet budget? We uh, we do have vacancies that we are that we are effectively holding because we. Um, we, uh, we had put in the original draft proposal um, to, to include more roles than what we had, but the decision of the time was that because of the market and the inability to, to fill these positions that, um, on day one, that we would not um, fully, fully fund them in, on day one. So 
Uh, the decision was for the Chief Executive to then determine um, uh, how to give effect to, to that reduction and at this point in time we've chosen to, to push pause on, on some vacancies. Let's not say we're pushing pause on all of them. Um, the, the other complicating factor in this budget is where, where we do have some positions that are vacant, where we have actively tried to recruit and can't fill, there are some roles in which we have to backfill, which, which isn't um, as cost effective as actually having the staff um, on board. So uh, that comes out of that same bucket of money. So can I just um, tease that out just for a moment? Uh, are there new, new roles that are established through the, um, the draft budget process that are put in place through that March to June time period um, whilst that budget is only a draft? The, the, the roles are, are put forward to reflect the, the work programmes and, and as you recall, the bulk of where, we, where the increases were factored for was in the capitalised uh, labour space and that is predominantly where the positions are being held, which we do have options of using um, external people as well in that space, but but um, we we have consciously made a decision to hold back on bringing that, those staff in, on board at this point in time, so that we can stay within our budget confines. Okay, thanks. Uh, the deputy mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, staff, for the report. Just with regards to um, page one eight six again. I see that the um, annual leave liabilities are increasing. Could you please um, share with us what the strategy is to manage that going forward? Yeah, um, Wayne Wilson, the acting uh, people, chief people officer. So there's, there's two things. Uh, annual leave does go up this time of the year and we, we have a significant drop uh, over the Christmas period where the council closes down predominantly. So, um, And the other thing we, we do is we monitor people who have uh, high levels of, of leave and we actively manage that. And the third thing we've done is we've reduced the amount of uh, leave that people can um, uh, accumulate uh, before we start actively managing it. So those are the three actions that we take. Thank you very much. And the second thing I wanted to talk about, still on that same page, um, in that last paragraph when you mentioned that the vacancies have created a greater reliance on overtime, casual workers and external resources, um, and this creates a risk for the organisation through inefficiencies. Um, I was just wondering, I know Councillor Finlay asked about the PELD, the, the professional learning development opportunities for the staff. Does that include those people, the casual workers? As, because I see that as a mechanism for protecting them and the organisation, you know, by giving them professional learning development slash support. Yeah, again, uh, Wayne, from uh, Chief Act, Acting Chief People Officer. Um, training opportunities are... are, are delivered to those that we think it's going to give the best value to, and sometimes that is casual, but it's not uh, something that we do uh, actively on, in most casuals that we wouldn't be um, training them, uh, but in some circumstances we do. But we do look for opportunities for people to grow in the organisation, so some come in as casuals and then progress into permanent roles. Thank you, Wayne. I was just thinking... Um, uh, in terms of like that, for people coming in, regardless of whether they're full-time or casual, is there an induction programme? And have you audited that? Do you think that's sufficient? We're currently reviewing that to improve it because we do understand that it's not achieving as, as well as we would like it to. So we've got that under review at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Right. Um, there are no further questions. So... Thank you, Cam, um, Sue and Andrew. So we'll get the recommendations up. Just 
just waiting for the technology to catch up. Okay, I'm going to have to read them in just a moment and we'll get to those. All right, um, so rec recommendations to Council that Council receive uh, the memo titled Four Month uh, Performance and Financial Report, period ending 31 October 2022, for information uh, number two, that Council approve a new program titled uh, Three Waters Service Reform Transition and a budget of 2022-23 is added. Um, Increasing both the operational um, revenue. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Was that it? No. Okay, number two, that uh, council approve a new program titled Three Water Services Reform Transition and a budget for 2022 23 is added, increasing both the operating revenue and operating expenses by 825,000, as outlined in the Three Water Services Reform section of Appendix 9. Uh, that uh, Council approve the adjustments to the operating activities, uh, reallocating uh, the two million remuneration uh, budget, and that's a, a word change there, it was savings before, um, and reallocating overheads associated with the reorganisation of the infrastructure unit that was separated uh, three waters from roading, uh, as outlined in Appendix 9, noting these do not change uh, the total budget. I'm happy to move those, um, seconded by um, uh, Councillor Naylor. Um, Councillors, before we and I invite you to comment, um, yeah, it's, um, I thank the officers firstly for um, pulling together material, but clearly I think we do have, um, there is some, there is some issues. Um, and uh, personally, I do think uh, some of the questions that have been teased out around the staffing, uh, the vacancies, and actually the funding, I personally think that maybe the structure uh, we're working towards um, may, may need to be interrogated. Um, we've inherited it from previous management, and we're obviously still working along those, those, those lines. Um, and that's been teased out in some of the questions, uh, definitely. Um, Look, I encourage the officers to look at some of the language and commentary as well. Um, there was clearly um, some lines there that weren't correct, um, in my opinion, and uh, around uh, re um, reduction in remuneration when actually it was an increase. And uh, it just doesn't seem to have been acknowledged by management. So um, that needs to be noted, and, and it has been. appreciate that. Look, put simply, I think we can do, be doing better, and it's OK to say that. I mean, it's challenging times out there. It really is challenging times. So um, in all honesty, it's OK to say that we can be improving on some things. We've got some major projects on the go. Um, our, our wastewater um, consent, um, our, our ozone replacement, um, and a number of other catalytic um, projects that we're trying to work through, along with business as usual. So uh, we do need to keep the eye on, on the ball. And externally, there's so much change out there at the moment, government reforms uh, that are making uh, life um, uh, more complex as well. So um, again, thank you to the officers. Um, uh, I just would encourage that uh, um, we, um, yeah, we just perhaps um, reword some of the stuff that's coming to us and double check some of those numbers as well before they get to us. Thank you. Councillor Naylor. Thank you. Um, just acknowledging the work that's gone into this um, report, um, and obviously the first four months of what I think is going to be um, a challenging, challenging year to to meet budget. Um, I think w that that started with a very challenging annual budget um, deliberation, and where we landed was very tight. Even the difference between our draft budget and the budget that we approved, we went from 
what had planned to be a $6 million surplus to only a very small surplus. And now we can see within the first four months we've, that's moved into a small deficit. I think we will, if we're really wanting to meet budget in this financial year, we're going to have to think about unbudgeted items as they come to us and really give consideration to what actually we can take out of the budget rather than just adding unbudgeted costs to this, this already stretched budget. Um, as the Mayor's already indicated, um, there were some concerns, I mean, I certainly had some concerns when I read this report around some of the language and how some things were framed, particularly thinking that if I was a new councillor reading this for the first time, it may actually, um, I actually may understand that we've reduced the remuneration budget, which is certainly not the case. We uh, made a difficult decision um, if through the annual budget process to increase it by 4.8 million or 9% rather than the 6.8 or 13% that had been in the draft. And we acknowledge that there will be some challenges for staff in delivering um, a smaller increase than what had originally been planned. But I do think we need to be really mindful of the order that we do things. A draft budget is a draft budget. And decisions should never be made to put things in place before that budget is actually approved by this council. Um, so when I do see um, suggestions that vacancies are being held with, um, in order to meet budget, I am concerned. I think we need um, thought needs to go into how that additional 4.8 million is applied across the organisation. Um, and if, if things have run ahead and um, positions have been established, perhaps in a way that um, makes it difficult to fund those positions, then I think we need to pull back and think about what we're doing. Um, it's been said that staff are the ingredients for services, and that's absolutely true. I think it's really important, and reading um, the challenges around our resources and reading the pressure that's putting on staff, I think I want to make it clear that for me personally, and I'm sure that people around this table are not expecting any suboptimal conditions for staff and that workloads should be manageable. What we are suggesting that if we can't deliver it within the budget, that we need to think about what services we're providing. And if that means that staff need to come back to us with in consideration of adjusting those services, then I welcome that and I ask for that rather than um, an expe expectation that staff might be trying to do more than what is reasonable. Um, so that's, uh, that's certainly um, my expectation going into this year. The expectation around the discussion around that remuneration budget was not just to make the staff do more with less. The expectation was that perhaps we need to, do adjust, to adjust what we were trying to do in this current year. Um, so I welcome that being an honest and open um, consideration for us as we go through this budget and if it does look like there are pressures we need to consider how we manage those pressures. Um, certainly that's a big responsibility for the CEO but I also think that if that means changes to services whether it be the capital um, delivery or other services then please bring that back to this table. I'm sure there will be support um, to ensure that we actually deliver the, the services that are essential, but that we do actually meet budget this year, and I, I'm certainly very interested in us meeting budget this year. Councillor Harpeter. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, just want to say thank you to the officers. I think this, this quarterly report improves every time we see it, and um, it has improved again, so thank you very much for all the effort that's gone into it. Cam, I know I've got my back to you. But thank you very much for all the effort that's gone into it because it has improved again from last time. So thank you very much um, for that improvement. Um, my comments are related directly to um, Cuba Street. Um, it is good to hear that it will be finished by the 16th of December, uh, particularly for those retailers that are on um, Cuba Street and for that Christmas rush. They will want that street to be finished for, before Christmas. I do think that our communication of it probably needs to improve. Um, we can't just continue to use Facebook. Um, I think Councillor Barrett teased that out. Um, there are retailers. I know we have got a group that's set up for that, that project, but we do need to use uh, the rest of our community doesn't always watch Facebook, so we do need to consider our rest of our community that needs to know about going onto that street. 
And so we just, yeah, just need to watch that communication avenue. Um, just the other thing I wanted to bring up, um, good to hear that that Civica project, which is ozone replacement, is um, on track and will be ready by the 1st of July. Again, communication on that would be good to be um, out and about. And um, if we are putting a, a hold on this, the Civic and Cultural Precinct Master Plan, we also need to communicate that out to our community because we've started that and if we're putting a hold on it, our community needs to know that as well. So it's just about communication for me. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, first of all, I agree with your comments about the report and also uh, substantially with Councillor Naylor's comments around the remuneration uh, and the way that that's been presented in the report. So um, I'm not going to repeat those comments, but I, I do I thoroughly agree with them. And um, I think it's very important to remember that um, we around this table, those of us who were here last term, um, sat through a succession of submissions from very, very angry residents demanding a reduction in their rates increase. And that one of the hard decisions we made was to reduce the increase in the remuneration budget. So not the total remuneration budget, but actually to reduce the increase. So instead of it being a 13% increase, it was a 9% increase. So I just think when we get reports like this, and, and I've noted all the page numbers that have commented on the $2 million reduction in the remuneration budget, I just think that needs to be tidied up for next time. Um, I did want to comment on two other areas. Uh, the first one is um, the library and community services. And we as a council don't uh, really have a lot of reporting back on the very good work that goes on in the library with the library programs and also in the community services programs. The only reporting back that, that really comes to us is in this quarterly report in the narrative comments around what has been achieved in those areas. And um, I think it's it's worth highlighting, and I do try and do it at each quarterly report, the very good work, um, a huge amount of work, uh, with communities um, that's going on through the library and through the community development team. And I think um, it's worth uh, just noting that because uh, very rarely does it even come up for questioning because the narrative reports are so good and the work's going on so well that we don't really need to ask about it. But I don't want it to be overlooked because I think it's very uh, important and essential work for the community well-being. So I, I do want to highlight that. Um, and my final comment is just around engagement, uh, which I did uh, ask a question to, to Andrew and uh, Councillor Barrett followed up. But um, we are consistently getting a message back from the community that they're not mm -hmm. satisfied with how we engage with them. And to... To continue to engage in the same way um, is not going to result in a better outcome. So I would like us to hear the message that people are not satisfied with how we engage them and to change the way that we're doing things to improve that uh, rather than just doing more of the same because I think, you know, uh, we're just going to get what we've always got. So I would encourage some... Uh, greater reflection on how we can do better in the engagement space. Um, and I think, um, you know, Councillor Hapter has touched on it. I'm, I'm sure Councillor Barrett will have something to say about it. But um, we can't ignore um, the feedback that we're getting from our community that they're not satisfied with how we're engaging. And so that something needs to change there. I'm not an expert on the best way to engage, but we do employ people who are. So uh, that is an area that I would like to see addressed. So, um, you know, uh, all up, we know it's going to be a challenging year. Um, some good work is in, in place. Um, we are going to have to keep a, a, a tight look on the budgets, as Councillor Naylor said, particularly given the um, rate of inflation, which is high enough, but also the services often that we contract have even higher rates of inflation than that. So um, the wor there was discussion uh, during the annual budget about whether or not we should be using uh, the assumption of interest rates and inflation rates that we were. And I did ask several questions around that, and it seemed that we were in some way obligated to use what we even knew at the time were very low estimates of interest rates and inflation rates. So I don't know whether um, there's any room for um, doing that differently in the next annual budget, but I think 
when it's clear even to those of us who are not financial experts around the table that the figures that we're using are, are vastly underdone in terms of interest rate and inflation rate, there must be something we can do to have a more realistic um, appraisal of what costs are going to be. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. It has been interesting to listen to the uh, conversation so far and different perspectives uh, around what this report tells us. Uh, I think for me, uh, looking at the report, my first reaction was actually quite positive, and I, I understand and, and hear that there have been a number of you know, comments around the, the challenges that we face, the headwinds, um, and those are quite real. But actually looking at the content of the report, looking at the, the um, depth of, of information available in there shows, to my mind at least, that we're actually advancing a lot of work on a lot of fronts and delivering a heck of a lot for the community. As, as Councillor Johnson just said, you look in the detail of some of those KPI um, indicator um, narratives now, and it is incredible reading what is actually being done day on day, month on month for um, this community, and Councillor Hoppett is absolutely right. Those um, reports have, have improved month on month or quarter on quarter for some time now, and I feel like now we've got a situation where there's enough richness around the indicators that we can actually start having some more meaningful conversations about outcomes and what's being done with all the activity and perhaps, at least to my mind, a little bit less focus on sort of individual details of, of individual projects. Having said that, I do have a couple pet projects that I'll be keeping my eye on, no doubt. Um, <laughs> I do feel I need to, to respond in some measure to temper the, the comments around um, draft budgets and well acknowledge what Councillor Naylor said in theory is true. We cannot accept the budget as final until it is final. Um, we also have to be realistic that there's sometimes less than 48 hours between the acceptance of a final draft budget and turning it into the budget and the implementation of that budget. So realistically, unless we want to put everything on ice for weeks or months at the start of a financial year, some things do need to be in train and need to be um, driven um, across financial years to, to really get best value out of the effort um, that we're putting in. Um, Several um, have already, uh, I guess, commented on specific areas, and I think, you know, it's was, it was quite interesting listening to the questions and, and answers, um, you know, identifying, I think, you know, some, some clear areas for um, improvement and where there is concern um, from elected members and I think really from the broader community in terms of um, where we do need to continue focusing on lifting our game, and I think some of that, for me, still sits um, in that um, engagement space in our local reputation space, and as I've said in, in the questions, or as I alluded to in the questions, I do have concerns where we start to prioritize um, external voices um, and media commentary over actually what the people who pay their taxes to us to reinvest are saying about things. It's the local voice, it's the community voice that fundamentally we need to make sure um, we are getting um, good feedback from, and I'll always be prioritizing that voice um, first in terms of how we um, take on board messages about how we're going or how we're not going and would encourage everyone else to, to put their efforts there as well. Um, probably in my commentary there, there's obviously lots of specific things in the report that um, could be um, justify a dive in, but look, overall again, um, I'm hugely heartened actually by what I, what I read there. There's a tremendous amount of activity happening um, on behalf of the community through this council um, through the first four months. Yes, there are challenges, but an incredible amount of good news in there as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Isabella. Thank you. Um, that's an enormous report and a huge amount of work. And I wanted to start by um, thanking you. As a new member, I found that um, incredibly helpful and informative and in wrapping my head around all of the wonderful work that is going on um, through Council and some of the significant challenges that we are facing. Um, so yes, the value of that document to me cannot be 
understated. I found the thoroughness of the KPIs, the measures and uh, targets to be very well articulated. So my comments today just uh, relate specifically to goal four, the eco city, because I felt uh, in reading this, that was a bit of an outlier in terms of the thoroughness and specificity of some of those measures and targets. And there's a fair amount of duplication that I picked up in uh, the climate change and environmental sustainability aspects of those work um, of this document. So climate change uh, measure number one and environmental sustainability number one are the same. That's the same for climate change number three and environmental sustainability number two. Um, and that results in some duplicating of reporting in terms of the narrative that goes on um, for those different items. And I, I've realised that those are not, uh, these don't operate in silos. So there is some crossover, but uh, compared with, conversely, the river has uh, has a single, Manawatu River has a single measure, but there are three, I would say, distinct measures uh, encapsulated within that one measure, and as a result, the target is, is a single target that incorporates three distinct and quite different uh, aspects. So I noticed just a little bit of... Um, discrepancy there, I guess. So I'd, I'd query whether those particular measures are uh, fit for purpose or whether they're sufficiently defined and differentiated from each other and what they are trying to achieve. Um, and they're quite high level compared to some of the other measures that are in goal four. If we look at resource recovery, stormwater and wastewater, for instance, they are really specific in what their targets are that they're trying to achieve. So I look forward to the opportunity to maybe delve into that, set some more tangible measures that we can go forward with in the LTP, uh, during the LTP process. Because the effects of unseasonable weather on our work programme is all over this report. It's all over it. Rain has been stopping play in a big way and it has been escalating costs for us in a big way. And that's something that we can anticipate will continue. As a sustainability, uh, uh, environmental sustainability as a, uh, as a unit in this document, I guess, sustainability is about us being able to continue our activities in some form in the face of these kinds of changes. Um, if we're seeing the impacts of unseasonable weather, of geopolitical change, financial change, in our work programme, in our budgets, really starkly laid out here. I think that's a great opportunity for us to take those measures and really drill down to some specific, tangible targets, as we see elsewhere in the document, to help us respond to that uh, and to be more targeted about how we're achieving those particular um, targets and measures. Thank you. Online, uh, Councillor Wood. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and I'd like to start by uh, agreeing with Councillor Zabellin. As a new member, this does make for very interesting reading. Uh, and agree with Councillor Barrett. Um, although I recognise the concerns and issues that many members around the table have brought up, for the most part, it is a very positive and very interesting report to read. And there's a hang of a lot of good work going on. Um, being new, I don't know if these targets and measures are set by the council or if these targets and measures are set by the organisational branch of the council and therefore are purely organisational. But I, I'm possibly being a bit nitpicky here and I apologise if there is a point later on in the next year that we do um, determine these. But a number of our targets have very clear percentage-based uh, measures, greater than 80% um, in terms of our quality of ride, you know, 3.5%. Uh, in terms of our resealing of roads. There are a few measures here, um, and I, I draw back to my question around uh, the number of serious crashes, where our target probably doesn't quite line up with what I would like to see. Um, just because there's been a decrease in one uh, in terms of our crashes in the year, there's actually been an increase in five of the number of fatal crashes. So to say that we're on track when actually we've had five more fatal crashes in the city this year than last year doesn't quite sit right with me. Uh, same goes for our uh, total organisational emissions where we just say all we want is a decrease. So as a council, I guess I'd indicate that I would like to see perhaps percentage-based target attached to some of these uh, measures. You know, let's say we would like to see a 3% reduction in crashes in the city or a 5% reduction. Same goes for carbon. We might like to see a 2% reduction in total organisational emissions rather than just the word decrease, because otherwise we do end up in a situation where potentially statistically insignificant decreases um, that are a result of luck or chance get measured as us 
actually reaching our target. Um, so yeah, that would be my comment. I would like to see, if possible, perhaps greater percentage-based targets uh, where all that's stated is the word decrease or increase. Um, but yeah, thank you very much to the officers for the report. Very interesting reading and um, greatly appreciated. Uh, Councillor Finlay. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, just recently, well, several times, I've, um, people have come up to me and asked me how do they get a job in the uh, council. And we're constantly told there's 100 vacancies and there's 100 and something vacancies. So I tell the people to go to the website and have a look, see what's there. So we look at the day and we see we've got 93 to 100 vacancies. But I just had a quick look at the website. There's eight vacancies on the website. So where are the rest? Is a good question. So if we have all these vacancies in council, perhaps we should keep our website updated so people can know and maybe get the jobs in council. It was just a comment to make. Look, thank you, councillors. Um, uh, just as a right of reply, look, um, I, I agree with Councillor Barrett and, and some of the other comments. Um, this council does a huge amount, and we've got to treat this positively. These reports are a point in time. Um, perhaps it's how we communicate that sometimes. I mean, I look on social and, you know, we get smashed. Um, and, and sometimes it's the keyboard warriors, but actually... I do look at some of the comments and it's how we're communicating stuff at times. It's the language we've used in this report. Um, it's the measures that some of the new elected members of. It's quite good to have some fresh eyes on things, uh, looking at some of the measures. So I just say to the officers, um, you know, we, just, we probably just need to um, have, have a little look at how we're doing that because actually we're doing, we actually are doing okay in a, in a, in a, in a bigger sense. Using the 80-20 rule, we, we are... Um, it's, it's that 20 which we're obviously not getting right. Um, and look, the, we've got the residence survey, and I guess that's worth noting as well. Uh, I know that's going to come back to us, I understand that's coming back to us separately. And again, that's just a point in time, and I'm sure things will improve. You don't raise rates, have COVID, have worldwide crises, and, and expect everything to go swimmingly well. Um, there is going to be some pushback somewhere. So again, I think this is um, a little bit of this is, but we can't ignore that either. I mean, there is, this is a bit of lag. Um, you know, we have a new CE, and I can quite honestly say I'm sensing a, uh, a stronger steer of the organisation on the rudder uh, where we're going. So um, I look forward to the next um, quarterly report. Um, and um, yeah, th again, just thank you to the officers for the work. There is a lot of work that goes into this, so I appreciate that. On that note, we will vote, please. That has passed 16 votes for, none against. Thank you, councillors. Right, um, we will break now till 1.15. We'll come back into this chamber. If I can just say to the officers that are going to deliver the workshop um, briefing, we'll do it in here at 1.15.